Hi everybody and welcome. I'm Aurora, February 28th, 2024. This is level one, lesson four. Thank you, very good. Just pulling up my notes, making sure that I've got everything. The official name of this lesson is Organic and Inorganic Beings but that can be a rather confusing use of vocabulary words in light of everything transhumanist that is going on. So I'll just begin by defining terms. This is what we do in math. So I'm very, very vocal. I'm not a transhumanist in any way, and I hope that none of my work is ever taken out of context in order to uh, promote or um, be an excuse maker or anything like that, can promote or justify the practice, practice of transhumanism. So when I am talking throughout this whole entire class about organic and inorganic life, what I'm really doing is making a distinction between your biological somatic cellular presence, your anthropomorphic humanoid form, and your form that is of pure energy. So organic is biological and cellular and somatic and flesh and the inorganic means something that is made out of pure light, which is pure information, consciousness, potentials, time and potentials. And that is what I'm holding up when I hold up this shape. So a big emphasis in our class is that this shape is not just um, you know, a, a diagram that it, it, so it represents time, timelines, possibilities, but also statistical probabilities in the sense that the central core timeline going up the middle is the path of least likelihood that there's only one of that path. And then you have a multiplicity of parallel realities around that. So statistically least likely, but inevitable that is your path as an ascended master. So I've gotten across already to you guys the, con the uh, concept that this is made out of time. It's your light body, it's made out of information, it's your time body. This is also a body of coherent consciousness that is you in a higher evolved state. So when I talk about a partnership between yourself as a biological form and yourself as a pure energy being, this is about a partnership between yourself and yourself not yourself and anything that's some fake, unwholesome, non-life-affirming thing. That's really big. Because transhumanist, it is portrayed as the melding of the human mind plus machinery. But it also is the inhabitation of you as a biological organism by levels of, I would only call them awareness, not even consciousness, that are aberrant of aberration, something that should not even exist. So technology right now and throughout like ancient times has been used as a container for, I don't even want to really call it consciousness, but let's say some form of awareness or sentience or be ent entity. Hi, Lucy. Great to see you. Um, and hello. Hello. Yes. Awesome. Because we know you're always super busy and joining us from your, from your desk at work. So thank you. And for people who don't know, Lucy is a publisher of my work. She did my DVDs back when things were on a DVD and is a longtime lasagna supporter and lasagna dancer. So very, very pleased. And I have the to little me. earrings. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> You're fantastic. Good. Those <laughs> earrings, they've got the, the price of 3D printing has gone up so much that now I have to charge a lot for them. So I'm happy that you have some of those original originals on my there. desk every day. Fantastic. Yes. Really, really good. And your hair looks fantastic. Oh, thank you, that. my dear. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> So um, refocusing on what, what, we're, what we're talking about here, the, my warning against transhumanism in the sense of it being an attempt for something that is non-biological and non-wholesome to occupy either with or without consent your body form, influence your behavior, influence your mind, and even influence, put down my stuff so I can gesture, the dance movements of your DNA, because the dance movements of your DNA are directly tied to time, structures of time, and the capacity to manifest and make things happen in time, which is a huge power and a huge responsibility. So I warn you against this, I don't want this to happen. I got a lot of personal vested interest here. Not only do I live on this planet and in this world, but all DNA is connected. 
So there is not just one way to be like, oh, there's just a little problem with DNA over there. It's not going to affect little old me. It affects little old you because you're in a symphony and these DNA strings are the vibrating strings of um, consciousness and time uh, potentials. And they absolutely radiate outward and um, create waves, probability waves that eventually will um, rock your boat if it's not addressed. And that is part of my motivation, the impetus as I duck down to grab my sculpture for me to spontaneously make the flying rainbow lasagna as a portal to come into this body and have an impact on reality. Because I'm like, I don't like what's happening. I don't like the potentials of what I see. I get to actually get embodied and change something. And that's also part of the justification for when you act, when you're here, you have a body, you have real estate, you get to vote, you vote with your actions and with your um, intentions and with what you you know consent or agree to or what you do not consent and agree to. And so yeah, I'm here, I'm an inhabitant. It's like being a citizen, like I, I pay my rent. I buy gas or petrol at the station, fill up my car, go to the food store, buy my different foods. I participate. And this now you can comprehend why I do these things. I'm like, oh, I participate. I do all these things. I get to have a voice. In contrast with all the stuff that is not supposed to exist, the aberrations, stuff that is not wholesome, not healthy, not part of divine consciousness, not something that adds to the whole, something that is a detractor and a diminisher and even a destroyer of the whole. You don't want that stuff to enter the hole. And if my water looks cloudy, it's because I put electrolytes in there. You don't want this stuff to enter you. You don't want this stuff to enter your DNA. So when I talk about this wonderful partnership between your organic and your inorganic self, please never be mis please never misconstrue what I'm talking about as having a wide open door and being like, okay, all technological doo-doo heads, anybody can come inside. No, 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 big no. You must be extremely selective about who and what you partner with. So I, I actually, I don't have to self-rant. You know, I go back and I listen to my lessons and sometimes I'm like, that was wrong. I need to tell everybody, <laughs> ring the bell. Ring, tell everybody, that was wrong. Let's do it better this time. But um, I don't have to self-rant because I actually warned you 10 years ago. And back then I used language like talking about things that are undead, semi-alive, or even mythological creatures that are um, stealers or siphoners of life force energy. Vampires, zombies, the undead, um, all of those things are their mythological, cultural, inter interpreting things through your cultural filter, but there's a basis in reality of stuff that doesn't have like the merit of its own life. Either there's two crack categories actually, rough categories. One is stuff that was never alive. We'll call them never alives. They never got the band. They never got to be in the band. They never passed the audition. They have never been in an embodiment form. And um, there's very good reasons for that. Because in order to be alive, I've told you this many times, you have to pass the audition. Good job, kid, you passed the audition. You got to be alive here in the biological world. Even the person, like if you could think of a person that you know in your life that is not together, like even the most not together person that might be struggling with mental health issues or addictions or diminishments in their life or they don't wash the dishes or whatever they don't do that's not very good, they at least pass the audition. They're not a perfect person. They're definitely a work in progress. They got a lot of problems. You guys can think of people like this in your life, but um, they're alive. They're alive. They have a soul a genuine consciousness, they are connected to God, they are supposed to be in existence, they're alive. In contrast with never alives, never alives are epitomize characteristics that should never come into the world. They, should, they are non-life-giving characteristics. So this can be aspects of their, their, they are misshapen, essentially, they are misshapen time objects, but it is exemplified in um, anthropocentric interpretation as non-benevolent characteristics. Like these would be things that are insane, that don't take responsibility, that are pathologically violent, that are uh, willing to um, harm the entirety uh, in order to elevate themselves. Elevate themselves at the expense of the entirety. Pedro's come up with another 
acronym for us. Drum roll, please. These are momentous moments in time. NABs, never alive beings. Very good, very good. Never alive. Although, I, mean, I don't know, not to be critical of you, Pedro, but I don't know if we should call them beings because I am on the fence of calling them non beings. So, because they, they unbe, they don't be, they unbe. They should never be. But, but thank you, and I appreciate the lightheartedness too because we need that sometimes too. Some stuff should never be. And some stuff has come into being, passed the audition, was biological at some point, and then become, became grotesquely distorted, horribly diminished, um, you know, to the point of being unrecognizable as what it is actually supposed to be, and then somehow being a fragment or an echo of that organism when it was alive. So it is possible for someone or something to pass the basic requirements of coming into biological reality and then do a very, very bad job, I want to say an SHIT job, a bad job of being alive and um, do all these things, make all these horrible decisions and become uh, a very unhealthy example of what life can be. And then in their death, to be like a fragment, an unresolved something, a smear on the membrane of death, a smear on the lens of time, an unresolved trauma. But that's different. Like if you guys, I'm talking about, you know, if you guys had a, a trauma, you were unresolved, something happened, whatever, you got, uh, you know, badly mutilated and then you died. You wouldn't be one of these things. You, you wouldn't be like an unrestful spirit or something that says like, oh, poor me, I got traumatized. Now I got to go around like a hungry ghost eating other people. You wouldn't do that. You are good people. You'd be like, wow, something bad happened to me. I got traumatized. Now I got to go through my life review and get resolved and blah, 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 and then go on my journey and go in a different direction. So it's the, the difference between recognizing the trauma, going through the healing process, and then moving onward as consciousness versus what these very unwholesome things do, which might be hang around on the lower astral plane, being unresolved, causing perturbations, making problems for everyone and everything else, it, resisting the healing process, and even causing more suffering. That these are like these unresolved echoes or fragments, or I sometimes don't even have language to be able to describe them. So the things that are never alive, that never were, they are more like mere constructs even the scariest demons, that that's really what you're dealing with, something that is a construct that is not a biological entity. Then there's these uh, twisted, distorted things that once were alive, were biological entities went co totally down the wrong roads in life and then ended up in uh, contorted positions in time. And that those things, they need to be resolved, um, but also uh, they need to embrace the healing or process of resolution. And that would be like a vamp, the, your myth of a vampire. A vampire is a person who once was a regular person who ate things like tomatoes and hamburgers and you know French fries, and then um, got some kind of a horrible supernatural curse put upon them, and then all they could do is drink the blood of the living. That's this type of a myth. All of that in order to say, the none of what I'm talking about means I'm partner with vampires. Do not ever partner with vampires. Do not partner with vampires. Do not partner with demons. Do not partner with any of these unwholesome entities, including a lot of self-proclaimed extraterrestrial or extra-dimensionals that are using technology in order to be able to connect with your mind. And they do it prematurely as to what they actually should be doing. So at a certain point, you will become a galactic citizen, and that means that you have fully awakened higher faculties, and your telepathy is online. It's natural love-based telepathy, and it's a time telephone that you can use to be able to talk with and contact almost anyone at any time, place. But you don't just call people randomly, like prank phone calling. You call people up and ask them if their refrigerator is running. No, you don't just prank call people in time. You do these connections mind to mind, with a very uh, specific intention. You're a good musician playing the music, divine music of the symphony of life. And so you have a purpose for interacting with these specific other consciousnesses. So there are many different, let's call them space races or organisms or organizations in different time places. And they use all sorts of synthetic telepathy. It is an artificial implantation or augmentation of the telepathic capacity 
time phone but not natural and they don't care they prank call and they imposter and impersonate and they're also scam artists so they're like these uh when you get these ro we call them robocalls um when you get these calls on your physical phone that are like um you might qualify for blah 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 loan call us immediately or they'll they'll scam you and they'll say like your amazon account has been hacked or your bank account has been hacked call us immediately and please give us all of your passwords like you, you understand the same things that you face in your mundane reality are scams that you face in the world of spiritual attainment so just because this is big takeaway for everyone who's in the process of self-evolution um recognition awakening your higher senses you have to have a lot of skepticism in exactly the same way that if you if, if you were young people and i gave you your first cell phone then i would be like look this is not a toy <laughs> don't prank other people and also um you have to be skeptical of who's calling you i would be very i would be looking at my kids recent you know that i would be looking at all those phone numbers i'd be like who's this who's this who's this um because i don't want my kid to get um you know scammed and sometimes there are older inappropriate people that groom children calling them up for forming relationships with them and um bringing them into inappropriate relationships there's extraterrestrials and extra dimensionals who do that to you as humans they are unscrupulous slightly older or more advanced races or species or organisms and they have zero morals and zero value and they have no problem with um, using their artificially implanted non-loving time phone to call up you as like you know teenagers who are just starting to awaken your telepathy and grooming you and the pleiadians are one of the groups that do this they are not friends and you know what i can tell you this flat out because they lost their natural ability to have this mind crystal up here you guys have natural mind crystals but you know a lot of things where's my wait i'm not fully prepared for class to hold up this important piece of paper and not spill my drink while i move the whole table this stuff has been attacking your natural mind crystal um, but these guys, they don't have a natural functional mind crystal. They haven't had that for a long time. So what they do is they have a rite of passage where they have an implantation of an artificially created mind crystal, but it is not earned and it comes at great expense of other organisms. So they are standing on the shoulders of others so that they can get a breath of fresh air, but they're drowning the people that they are standing upon. It is criminal illegal activity just because it's done on a on a wide basis throughout you know this culture or you know organization or planet or however, whatever you would like to call it does not justify or excuse it so to be succinct the very technology that they use to reach across time and talk to your minds is illegal harmful and corrosive stuff that is illegal on a cosmic level isn't just randomly illegal like here like you need a fishing license otherwise it's illegal to fish you need a blah blah you need a blah blah you know what i'm talking about random stupid human created arbitrary laws cosmic law is not arbitrary it is very very based in um there are reasons for why things are illegal because some things are incredibly harmful so this stuff um these artificial mind crystal implantations of Pleiadians and some of the other name brand extraterrestrials and also some that are not you know what I call name brand that means that you might not hear about them at a UFO conference but they're still interactive with your minds and shaping human culture through their interactivities totally irresponsible totally not right and when I say grooming it is even in the sense of when uh, older people contact young people, call them on the telephone, and their young people are underage, they cannot give consent. They're too young to be able to say whether they want to be in a relationship. But the grooming is like, oh, as soon as you become 16 or 18 or whatever is the age of consent in your area, be sure to come to this very questionable hotel room with me and do questionable things with me and so um it's the reaching of someone who is still in the vulnerable states of early development 
And then when I say grooming, I'm talking about um, guiding them and guiding their development so that they will be open to your overtures, something that they might never have agreed to if they naturally developed into adulthood. So the Pleiadians have done that here in this world. They've been grooming humans for a long time and some people have Pleiadian fan clubs, blah, 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 and they're all ready to go to a hotel room with a Pleiadian upon their 18th birthday. And I'm like, no, this just, no, I'm not going to let that happen because these guys are not good guys and I'm not going to let them do that to you even if you think that's what you want. And so that's good parenting. Like when you recognize that like your child's mind has been influenced by these unwholesome, um, you know, seniors or slight, slightly more advanced um, creatures and you're like, no, I'm not going to let that happen because you got to protect people who aren't even at the stage of development where they can see and sense clearly and make their own good decisions. And this is part of being in community. And you don't just be like, go off and do whatever you want to do. Um, and then, you know, like have a horrible experience and then I'll pick up the pieces later because stuff that happens in time and stuff that happens in DNA affects all of us. So you don't have to just let someone else crash and burn or be horribly destroyed and then be like, oh great, now I pick up the pieces because this is destabilizing all of us. You can actually act to prevent this. In this moment right now that I am warning you, I am acting to prevent this. If you're one of those people that's like, but no, my Pleiadian friends, they're my friends, I love them. Um, they, if I'm pushing buttons or touching sacred cows, if you feel upset by what I'm saying, if you feel triggered is what I'm trying to say, um, just please assess the origins of why you might be upset because I have only one agenda and that is to promote uh, your, your own empowerment, your own freedom. I'm not trying to take you over. I'm not trying to be like, don't go to that hotel room with the Pleiadians, go to that hotel room with me. No, actually, I very, very, very clearly have not been grooming humanity. What I do is I say, I'm gonna instill really, really great values in you, protect you, get you to your stages of evolution and ascension. And then if you want to play music with me in my giant symphony that is called Aurora and is part of the galaxy, then you are welcome to do so. You got it? Very, very, very different value system as evidenced by behavior. And that's why I've been here for 20 years because you know, like actions speak louder than words. And a lot of other guys have been trying to take advantage of you. And I've been here not trying to take advantage of you at all, really trying to protect you and um, give you a pristine environment so that you could grow up properly. And then, um, cause you, you can't have a real relationship if it's based on lies. If I came here and lied to you for 20 years as Aurora, and then you became awakened and you could see everything. And you'd be like, Aurora, like you've been lying to us for 20 years. Like how can we have a relationship? You could, it wouldn't work, it would never work. So really the only way to have a real relationship as me, an otherworldly, um, faster um, individual with you um, is to have it start off on a foundation of freedom and free will. Uh, when I say faster, this goes to my notes from 10 years ago, which actually are really, really good and worth, worth reading, even though they're incomplete because I didn't do part two. Um, when you meet an otherworldly creature or entity, sometimes what you want to say is like, where are you from? But these are even inadequate questions that speak to your limitation of how you are experiencing and embedded in time, your limitations of your perception to say, when are you from? How fast are you moving? Okay, because right now you are surrounded by an enormous uh, group of totally benevolent light beings that are moving at a different rate, at a different speed than you are moving. And in this way, it is making it difficult for you to perceive them and interact with them directly. So last week, I think it was, I was telling you all about your visual perception and the um, biological tendency you have to do what is called persistence of vision. And that is the recognition that you're looking at flat, static moments of time separated at the Planck length, but the um, gyrations of your DNA and the spinning wheels of your chakras become a vivifying lens that gives uh, emotion and um, another dimension that is called time to the static images that you're looking at all around you. So your, your persistence of vision is directly related to your chakras, which are also tying through their movement, 
tying together individual discrete moments in time. And um, when you're looking at time, you are able to access a certain frame rate. Let's just say like, you know, when you look at a movie, an old fashioned film in your theaters here, it's 26 frames per second. So we'll just say that's like your regular world. That's your regular world, 26 frames per second. But let's say maybe there's another world that is embedded and overlapping in your world, but it's moving at 100 or 200 or 1,000 or a billion frames per second. And it's moving at such a fast frequency rate that you are not able to perceive it. Literally, your DNA, the dance of your DNA, and the behavior of your DNA is an antenna-like structure that allows you to tune into different levels and layers of reality. And when you are meeting higher dimensional creatures, entities, organisms, for lack of a better word, none of this is um, <laughs> diminishing. So if you called a human a creature, be like, who are you calling a creature? Like, I'm a man. That's from an old movie. I won't get into quoting movies at this point in, in our class. I won't get that silly. But you are a human, not merely a creature. But to call these other organisms or entities creatures, like it's, it's understand, it's comprehensible, it's forgivable, um, it's not rude, um, because their form is very different than you. Because it's almost, in, you can barely even perceive them, much less comprehend what they are as entities, as beings. So first of all, in my supplemental homework lessons on YouTube, this like old playlist, I do have a good thing stored up in there that you can check out. It's an animated movie called Flatland, which I really love. I'm a very math, I wanna say I'm a math nerd. I'm a very math oriented person. I watch math videos just for fun, to relax at the end of the day, because I just love numbers. Um, but Flatland is a animation made from a uh, kind of novella that was written by a mathematician back in the 1800s. So it's got some silly stuff in there about males versus females. But uh, the basis is very worth delving into because it talks about, let's just pick up something that's flat. Like here's my notebook here. Um, a world called Flatland. Like if you can imagine this page of my notebook is their whole entire world and they don't contain the third dimension. And then here, just pick this up. Even though in the book it was a sphere, not a donut. But this guy lives in Flatland and at a certain point he meets a sphere. But what he sees is slices. Like if you can imagine, you're looking at this whole entire object because you can occupy the three dimension, third dimension rather, but this guy could only see slices. Like as it was coming through his dimension, he saw a, a circle and then a bigger circle and then a smaller circle again because it was like slices going through his dimension. He couldn't even perceive what this thing was. It's worth it. It's a very, very cute, funny movie. And then uh, the sphere is like, you can't even see who and what I really am. He's just, a, I'm, he's like, I'm a regular sphere from Sphereland. Um, but this guy in Flatland, he's ready to worship him. He's like, oh, your most spherical roundness, the divine perfection of your, of your formfulness is, is amazing to me. He's like, look, you're going to have to come into my dimension to see what's going on. So he kind of whisks him up off of the surface, uh, like tilts him upright so that this two-dimensional guy can see. And he sees the sphere. And he also sees like the 3D world. And his eyes are like, he's like, oh, he's like worshiping everything. Um, so all of that is beautiful, funny, lighthearted allegory for very deep truth. Like a lot of what humanity has um, fallen on its knees to worship is higher dimensional entities and organisms that you are only perceiving slices or glimpses or small fragments of because you haven't had the perceptual equipment to effectively perceive and interpret what you're interacting with. And it, it, Flatland was very cute because the guy's like, I'm just a regular sphere, but this guy's worshiping him as a god. And then it does make a lot of allegories with what humans have done in terms of otherworldly visitors, avatars of goodness that have come to us from um, higher dimensions. And that um, it, it appears as if they're performing miracles, what they're really doing is acting in a higher dimension. And this is not to diminish the goodness of the miracles of the visitors that came here, but just to give you a little bit of intellectual integument 
It's kind of like ran miracles aren't random, although they are supernatural and inexplicable to your present um, conception of reality and your viewpoint. When you get into the next highest dimension, you're like, oh, that's how that stuff can happen. Now I understand it. And it doesn't diminish it or make it any less valuable. It's still pretty amazing, good stuff that that is able to happen. But now you can comprehend how it happens, okay? Those levels of higher dimensional benevolent organisms or entities, that's with whom you wish to partner, and that's also you. I say this all the time, like spoiler alert, it's who you become after many stages of evolution and refinement and getting faster. So who you are right now, your definition of self is largely based in being biologically embodied, experiencing time in a linear manner, and experiencing at you know, our baseline 26 frames per second. But as soon as you have access to higher dimensions and are able to move at a faster rate, your definition of self will change and expand. Okay, so wait, brief pause on me. Let me get to the chat. Pedro's agreeing. He says, okay, then we change the B for a T because they are things. So that makes them never alive things. Good, we're working on it. And Pedro also goes on to say, so our consciousness is jumping on a series of our statues. We are not really moving. Yes statues. I like how you say that. Like here, like I'm going to pretend to be a statue. You know, like a frozen version of you. And then your consciousness is jumping between these different frozen versions of you. And yes, and really the animation comes from your own self as a higher dimensional object. So comprehending that initially is a huge release and a huge freedom, like the chains are coming off of you. And then because you're like, well, if I jump 26 frames per second, this is who I am. But then if I jump at 100 frames per second, this is who I am. And then if I jump at infinity frames per second, this is who I am, right? So now let me grab my little, my little thing and be able to share some imagery with you. Go to this. Oh, I think I'm, I don't know. I'm already doubting myself because I have like, no, nope, like this needs to go away. Wait, just, I have too many things on my screen. Wait, no, and life is hard. Okay, we got it. And I have the annotation too, life is fantastic, life is not hard. Okay, so in order to talk about this effectively with you, hold on, I can't do anything, sorry. I'm trying to make the thumbnails go right, I can't do it. Bear with me everyone. These are two pretty familiar images that you've seen. I might have done you a disservice in um, not explaining to you enough that chakras are not static images, they are moving. These are swirling energy fields. So also what I do, wait, hold on a second, go back to me. Hold on, I can do this. I need to mute everyone, good. And then I need to do this. And then I need to share screen. And then I need to do this. Awesome, I did it, and then I need to do this. Awesome, fantastic. Okay, so these chakras that I've drawn for you here are like sharing with you perfect anatomy. I am an anatomist, and what I'm doing is showing what a perfectly healthy body looks like. So these chakras are all perfectly aligned with one another. Like for example, you can see where this orange kind of wheel-like structure meets the edge of this red chakra it meets perfectly. And you can see over here, yellow meets the edge of that uh, orange chakra perfectly. All of your chakras are nested and uh, interactive. So in order to have a frictionless experience of pure bliss and to live as an ascended master, these are the optimum configurations for your chakras. They must all be balanced and in perfect alignment. In your daily day-to-day -day experience, you rarely, if ever, experience this perfect alignment, largely because of distortions at the layer of yellow over here. Yellow is the layer of the human intellect. I call it OS human, like operating system human, and it is hacked. So what you're presently using as your mind for ego state and verbalization, what is called your daily waking consciousness, is a very diminished and malformed state of being. But that has been for a very long amount of time what humans defined themselves as. They're like, I am this diminished, malformed state of being, the ego. 
But your ego doesn't have to be diminished and malformed. Your language centers don't have to be um, deformed and hackable, but they are. Just like saying, okay, I'm not a fan of Microsoft software. I have a ranted lately for you guys against Microsoft software. Apple software is much, much better. I'm a techno intuitive. I can reach into Apple software with my mind, no problem. It's much, much, much better. But um, the whole entire Microsoft suite, like Windows and the Office 360 and all of that, it's really terrible. It's not very user friendly. And the structure of what it is, is not well formed. And so it's my example for you here, like one software system gets the job done and is structured pretty well and it's pretty good flow, frictionless bliss. And one software system like Microsoft, the evil empire, is very clunky, very poorly formed, does a lot of stuff that the user doesn't like, so not user friendly and also d diminishing the user. And also in this analogy, very apt because um, there's tons of back doors back doors you sign the software agreement you're like would you like to sign away your soul just click agree i'm joking but not really because when you click agree it's like great i will now access all of your, this is me talking as microsoft microsoft says great now i will access all of your emails and all of your documents and all of your this and all of your that with or without your consent not only access not only look but no touch that would be bad enough look but no touch that's a loss of privacy but how about look and touch not good reaches into your software system and moves stuff around i only know one person with a concrete example of this but they put a bunch of family photos in their hard drive where they thought it would be and then their google drive blah 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 and then all of a sudden their family photos weren't in the folder where they put them and it took help from you know a very wise college student <laughs> to be able to be like where's my photos how come i can't find this and they finally figured it out Oh, Google automatically moved and shifted the destination file of where your photos are. Now it's over here. That's not good, but this is a perfect analogy for what is done to your consciousness. Come here and you download the OS human operating system that is called your daily waking intellect when you're a tiny infant. And it takes you a couple of years to master this operating system so that, you know, some of what you're doing is um, biological and you're learning to move your arms and legs and control your digestive tract and have an immune system and some of it is intellectual where you're learning how to speak how to comprehend words the linear nature of time before during and after or yesterday today and tomorrow and then also self versus the world the definition of your ego but the problem is the interdimensional entities that created this languaging structure this brain patterning and this um, thought-based verbalization structure did it in order to cut you off here from all of this good stuff that's here. So I don't know if anyone's listening on a podcast, because I have a podcast version of this. Maybe you want to listen while you're like doing your cardio or something like that. But uh, I just drew a big line through the midsection solar plexus of the human and then everything up above there, green, light blue, dark blue, and violet, has been diminished in your access through the implantation of the verbalized human mind operating system. And that means diminished contact with divine consciousness because this stuff over here, your higher faculties, unconditional love and above, this is how you connect with divine consciousness. God, your own divine connection to God. So the diminishment of the human is implantation of this unhealthy software system that makes you have a constant verbalization and distortion layer in your mind that's very, very difficult for you to break through and reach not only directives from God, your, the highest consciousness, but also cellular support that this is really a large portion of the aging process is because the perturbations at the level of the human mind block out the access of the experiencer to regenerative levels of energy that flow to you from higher dimensions, from God. That's where you get your energy from. So in order to get energy and regenerate, like when you feel tired or sick, what do you need to do? You're like, duh, Aurora. I need to go to bed. I need to put on my pajamas and more, more specifically, I need to go into an unconscious state. I need to turn off my yellow hacked operating system level of consciousness and become unconscious. And when you do that, wait, now let me erase this. 
let me erase this. So here's this line. That's the line that's like the barrier when you're awake. Erase this line and then all of a sudden, all of this energy can flow through all of your energy centers again, including connecting to divine consciousness, receiving updates, information, and downloads, and more importantly, um, healing and restructuring directives for your body. And that that's what happens when you are asleep at night. It's essential in your present format until you get your hacked operating system cleared up, you, um, you need to turn it off for at least eight hours each day so that you can receive healing and regenerative energy directives from God. And that that is what makes the cells of your body get cleaned up and healed and um, cleared out and ready for the next day. It's not ideal. What you're supposed to do is ideally have this connection going on all the time. And it doesn't mean you would never feel tired or you would never wish to rest. What it means is that you would be able to regenerate and heal and be pro properly structured all throughout your day. Because I speak about this in the lessons from 10 years ago and in my notes. Mostly what happens to humans is you go unconscious at night, sleep and reconnect to your divine presence, receive all sorts of wonderful energy and information. So now I'm showing it coming from like, wait, erase this. Just erase, erase, erase. Coming from the top down, coming right on down into you through your highest dimensional connection to God and then circulating through all of these other layers. And these layers, of course, are part of your entire body. It's not like it comes out at the top of your head and then eventually goes to the bottom of your feet. Like these are allegories, don't be too literal. Um, it goes all the way through your whole entire body and then you wake up with your chakras in good alignment. And the biological um, uh, parallels of what's happening, what's happening at night is digestion, um, clearing out trash, um, clearing out cell metabolites, even autophagy, which is the clearing out of dead cells, broken cells, irrelevant um, cells, uh, fragments and stuff, you know, parts of your own body that are past their prime and that need to be dismantled and get out of your body. And also that's when a lot of immune system stuff happens. It's like your body scours itself and says, this is stuff, this is junk, you, 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 you don't belong here and you, 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 you were once great, but I'm cleaning my closet because you're worn out and you can't stay here anymore. Like you go through, I don't know if you guys ever do that. You go through your closet or you're like, throw out these socks, they have holes in them. This t-shirt's got a stain. This doesn't fit anymore. Just get it out, clean the closet. And you do that with the cells of your body. And then you wake up in the morning and you look like this. This is a good example of healthy body with all um, chakras in perfect alignment. And what that means is that every single one of these is spinning like a water wheel and has all of these wonderful, amazing figure eights and it's this amazing balance. So the big takeaway, there's not a way to just balance one chakra. You have to balance all of them because they are all interconnected, interpenetrate and have um, significance in how they interact and harmonically um, uh, affect one another. When you wake up in the morning in this world, your chakras are in perfect alignment and you just got a big giant um, contribution to your energetic bank account. So let's say every day you get a hundred units of energy and that hundred units of energy is actually like your perpetual motion machine energy. That's actually like how many units you could go for forever on 100 units of energy if there were no friction. When you exist in a blissful state with no mind friction, 100 units is plenty of energy that you can keep going literally forever. But what happens is you have your first thought of the day and that's usually right here. This chakra goes out of alignment and we could think of it as, you could think of it as going a, a diagonal angle or as a wobbling. And that is evidenced by your first thought. Your first, what's your first thought in the morning before you even open your eyes? You might be like, oh no, I'm back. Or, oh no, I gotta do stuff for work. Oh no, I gotta get the kids up. Oh no, I gotta put gas in the car. Oh no, I gotta make breakfast. Oh no, I gotta pay my Geico bill. Oh no, I gotta do this stuff. Whatever is your first thought of the day, that begins the destabilization process because yellow destabilizes, that means you have a thought. Then that thought gives you a feeling, then orange destabilizes, then that feeling gives you a change in your biochemistry, then that's red, red destabilizes. Then all of this destabilizes all of these things all the way up upstream 
and then you've already lost 25 units before you even woke up for your feet feet even hit the floor and then each successive thought structure and emotional response and physical expression destabilizes the chakras further more and more and more until by the end of the day you're down to like one unit of energy and you're like i am very tired and i have to go to sleep now and you go to sleep and you get all fixed up and you get 100 units of energy back again and then successively throughout your day you get more and more and more tired and then you get more units of energy and this is um actually not ideal this is actually not the way it's supposed to be um so little baby human infants have this amazing thing at the top of their head that is called the fontanelle that is literally right up here. It is a place at the top of the skull where the skull plates have not fully fused together yet and it's experienced this little soft spot of vulnerability. But that is also their crown chakra is fully open when they come here. And that means they still have their divine connection. And little babies, here's what they've got. Here's, when you're a little infant, the positive thing is you've got a divine connection and you've got tons of life force energy flowing into your body that is helping to inform your growth process, your biological expression, your protection from um, injury and disease. And also that gives babies a wonderful feeling. Like, I don't know if you guys have ever held a little tiny infant, but they're amazing. They're like little batteries. Like, you, why, why do adults love to hold them? Because you hold them not just because they're snuggly, but because they literally give you energy. They have their divine connection. And humans have, adults have largely diminished divine connections. But you hold on to these little infants and you're just like, oh, like, they're, you're co I can see the cosmos in your eyes and you're so wise and fantastic and miraculous and beautiful and babies remind you of why it's good to be alive and then it feels so good to hold them. Like, that's not just oxytocin or, um, uh, you know, human neurotransmitters and different forms of biomanipulation in order to make you care for your young. That's not just manipulation. It's very, very real response to being in the presence of God. You're divinely connected to God through that little infant. One friend of mine many years ago had a baby. I got to babysit when the baby was tiny. It was just like a little burrito. It was all wrapped up, a little burrito, and I just got to hold it and hug it against me. And I was like, this baby is totally a divine creature. And that is how you all are. That is how you all are when you come here. And then what happens is the implantation of the human mind, and this gets closed down. So let's get a different color for, now I'm gonna show this like, you start to learn a little bit more, you start to learn a little bit more, it closes down more, it closes down more, it closes down more, it closes down more, until when you get to be at the level that you're at mostly as an adult, you might have like 3%. What you used to have was 100% connection to God. And then as you have an operating system, human operating system, and the development of your ego construct, then it diminishes one's connection to God until you've only got a 3% connection. And then it's necessary, you get tired during the day, and it's necessary to um, rest and then replenish your energy systems. So, you know, what was it like in ancient concurrent Atlantis? We all had our divine connection all the time. And, um, sorry, because you saw this. If you're wondering what this is, it's a melatonin patch. Um, you, <laughs> divine connection all the time, and you didn't get tired, and you didn't grow old and decrepit, and you didn't have diseases. Like, so I talk about this in this, the um, recording from 10 years ago, too. It's an outdated, erroneous expectation that somehow when you're a teenager or a child, that's when you have the most energy in your life and then you're just going to get more decrepit and have less and less and less energy as your life goes on. So not only do you wake up in the morning with the most energy and then your energy <laughs> goes, goes right down. I hope AI doesn't choose that as my thumbnail. Doesn't go, your energy goes right down until you're, you know, you're, you're, um, 
at the lowest level throughout your day, but also the presumption that like when you're a little four year old kid or 11 years old or whatever, you've got tons of energy and you wake up in the morning, you're like jumping up and down on your bed and like waking everybody else up and the, and the adult. So, okay, this is, I, I don't have kids, but this is what it's usually like in a household of the family. Like the four year olds wake up early, they're jumping on top of their bed. They don't even have breakfast yet and they've got so much energy and the adults are like, oh no, the kids are awake. I can't wake up without coffee. Give me five more minutes. Kids, go eat cereal. I need to sleep more, right? Right. This is what's considered normal, normative in your world. It's not normal at all, um, but we can joke about it um, because it's not normal to say even, um, you know, some people think that humans peak at their athletic prowess in uh, maybe like when you're 16 or 18 years old. And it's all downhill from here. You're never gonna get stronger, you're never gonna get faster, and you're only gonna get like worse and worse out of shape. And I'm like, no, that's not true. And I exemplify that in my life. And I know there are many other people that are exemplifying that too. Like you definitely can get stronger and build muscle and um, become more flexible and learn new athletic skills and do all sorts of things as you gain many more decades in your 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, people do all sorts of things that are amazing athletically. So it's an erroneous presumption that is then borne out by many people's experience that you will have your greatest levels of energy and health and vitality when you're a child and then slowly decline until what is normal, what is normative but not ideal or correct is like, you know, you're, people joke about turning 30 and then you're like, oh, now when I bend over, my, I say, ow, my back or uh, whatever, you know, you can't, you can't do these things or, you know, your body becomes creaky or whatever it is. And then, then you're 40 and you're over the hill and then you're 50 and you might as well just die. Of course, I'm being very facetious and lying. You know, I'm not agreeing with any of those things, but that is how it is looked at in this world. Throw it all out the window because it has nothing at all to do with your chronological age, but that is the aging and decrepitude DNA behavior that has been implanted as an expectation as to how your car would run, your car, your body. But I'm trying to tell you like, no, you've been given this amazing body that is made by um, a wonderful manufacturer that stands behind its equipment 100% and that um, is made to last for a long time. You got plenty of miles left on your chassis. It's not meant to wear out in 50 years, not even in 60 years, not even in 100 years. Your body is actually meant to be able to last a much longer amount of time. In order for it to last longer, you have to treat it differently. A clean car goes far. Have you ever seen that at like the, um, the car wash? Like a little sign, you know, on the outside of the car wash advertising, clean car goes far. Um, but this is true. This is very, very true. It has to do with what you think and how you behave and how you act with your energy. So meditation, and I talk about this in um, the, the notes, is an act of freedom. When you meditate, you are being a freedom fighter. You're fighting against the implantations of the negative um, operating system that was implanted into you, you know, a, a, a la Microsoft, except from, you know, hu human, human soft, whatever it would be called, um, uh, ancient invaders, putting things into your mind in ways that are unhealthy and unhelpful. When you meditate, you remove that blockage at the level of the solar plexus so that all of that energy can circulate to God and you can also receive all of that energy and you can be restored and regenerated throughout your day. And the idea is, so meditation is taking control of your mind. Um, you can either you know, purge your system, you can get rid of that hacked operating system fully, um, but you can also get rid of the parts that are the back doors. That's what flying rainbow lasagna is, very selective ways of using your DNA to turn up the volume on certain abilities and turn down the volume on some things that are not life-giving, that are draining of your life force energy. So you definitely wanna be able to turn off your verbalized mind. That's the first thing, to go non-verbal. When they first implant the mind into you as a little child, you get someone talking in your head and you even might identify with that, like that voice is me, but that voice is not you and it needs an off button, but your society doesn't give you an off button. 
so you have to make one. And I joke about this too. When they first started making like Apple, it was called an iPod. That was like a little technological song library just for audio music. And uh, this came out, you know, a long time ago, like whatever, 10 or 15 years ago. I was very technologically ignorant and someone showed it to me. And I was like, what's that? Like, what's that thing do? And they're like, oh, it's got all my music on here. And I'm like, really cool. I like music. Show me what, what it's all about. And they showed it to me and there's play and there's pause and fast forward and rewind. I'm like, great, where's the off button? There's like, there's no off button. There's no stop. I'm like, there's just play and there's no stop. There's just play. There's no stop. There's pause, but there's no stop. And I'm like, very tricky because they've programmed in a way to make you listen to your music all day long, right? This is what goes on with the human mind that it is initially a cool, effective interface to be able to talk to other people about your, your needs. You're a little tiny preverbal infant, and you're like, I need something, but how do I get someone else to know what I need? Like, maybe if I just cry, it'll happen, but it doesn't always happen. And then you learn, like, oh, like this stuff is called apple juice, and if I want it, I say, me juice, and then they give it to me, you know, or whatever it is. And um, it, it is a way to serve your needs. Very, very effective, very positive, very empowering. But then the problem is the constant verbalized chatter that diminishes the connection that you should have to yourself as a faster presence. So if I go back to all of these beautiful pictures here, another critical comprehension. So these are moving like water wheels and also um, each layer, oh, I lost the annotation, but where I'm wiggling, each layer is a layer of you moving at a different rate through time. So 100% of these rainbow layers of non-optical light of time and presence is you or are you moving at a different rate. The fastest layer is the layer of violet, which is you moving at the fastest rate within what is known as the human octave. So here would be violet and here would be red. Red, your physical world, violet, your connection to the divine, and everything in between, your emotions, your intellect, your unconditional love, your um, ability to speak truth and communicate, and your eye of insight. These are all different layers of your own self. And these also are coherent light beings that you will become in process of your evolution. So when I talk about you becoming an organic being in um, partnership and collaboration with inorganic beings, I'm talking about you as a physical embodied anthropomorphic humanoid creature that needs to eat food and drink water to stay alive in partnership with your energy field that is around you, that is reciprocally sustaining you. That means you sustain it and it sustains you. When you eat your food in just the right way that I will describe, this is part of part two, then you are sustaining your energy field, which again is you, is not a zombie, is not a vampire, is not some evil thing that's trying to usurp you. Um, it's the real you. And when you eat your food, you are creating a, I would say, love portal, but you can also think of it as a recording of the experience of being alive. So what is the good part about being alive? I'll go back to my face. The good part about being alive is that you're alive and you get to eat things and that you have access to that level of in, input of energy into your system. How does energy enter your system. It enters through the food that you eat, the water that you drink, um, through um, tactile sensations on your skin and also through absorbing light through your skin. You have an aperture known as the physical body that you can use to gather and receive energy and resources from this world that you are submerged within. Very, very positive. And then when you're having that experience, you can be a direct broadcaster of the experience to these other layers of yourself that are purely energy, that don't have a physical mouth or an aperture with which to receive 
energy with which to receive like food and good stuff. And so the partnership is, it's not like you're eating for someone else, but is allowing someone else that is you moving at a faster rate to access your experience, like your real time experience of what it is to eat your food. This is the highest way to be able to eat your food. And um, I have to drink. You, you, you sustain yourself, but you also sustain your energy field. You are conscious. You are eating consciously. So even beyond mindfully, because mindful eating, the idea is you're turning off, like you're meditating when you're eating. You're turning off your, um, just muting you here. You're turning off your verbalized mind and eating in inner silence. And that's part of what you're doing, but it's, only a portion of it because that gives you a clear signal when you're not inwardly chattering um, of what your tastes and textures really are. Then the other part is the real connection to yourself in a higher dimension and allowing it to connect to your physical sensorium of what it is like to be alive and what it is like to eat this food. So that's pretty much your, not your job, not, you're just not a useless eater, quote unquote, to quote someone horrible. You are um, a celebrated eater in this world. And what you want to be doing is partnering very selectively with these aspects of yourself that are your coherent light family and sharing your food experience with them. Think of it as like sending postcards home. Like if you went to France, and you know you come from the United States and you went to France and you're eating these pastries and you're like these pastries are so good I wish I could send one home to all of my friends so they could taste how great they are but they can't cuz I'm here but I can send them a postcard and be able to say this is what my experience was like that is what you are doing with your partnership with the world of pure energy so I actually have a, a inner catalog of all of the good things that I've eaten while I've been here as Aurora. Um, and I do this intentionally, so you, I hope you guys know this about me initially. Like, for the most part, I'm very, very health conscious and selective in the foods that I eat, including my wonderful broccoli microgreens, support my broccoli microgreens business. And thank you so much to everybody who's becoming a customer. Um, yeah, I eat things like grilled chicken, and, you know, broccoli microgreens and, you know, scrambled eggs and just, you know, very s simple, plain, nourishing food. But sometimes I am going to eat a pastry. And if I'm going to eat a pastry, I'm going to do it the right way. So I remember like when I was in San Diego for a very brief amount of time, I'm like, here's a French bakery. And there was this amazing, it was an almond croissant, but they had done something to it that like covered it with some kind of like sugar glaze. And it was so crunchy and it was so flaky. So here is how you do this, right? It was a beautiful, set the scene because you're not just gonna get like the taste of what my tongue is tasting, you also eat the scenery. So beautiful small French bakery, I'm there with my dog, buy this and it's a splurge. I even remember it was like $4, like that's kind of a lot. And we went outside and there's a little cafe table. I'm sitting outside in the sunshine with my dog and I'm eating this pastry and they're like flaky crumbs and the crumbs are falling on the ground and my dog's eating the crumbs that are falling on the ground and I'm feeling all of the sensations and the tastes of what it is and just being in the moment and creating a perfectly clear experience or recording of what that moment is. That is part of my pastry catalog. I have some really good ones, all right? So this is really important because you know, here's what you don't do. You don't do like get your pastry, take it to go, eat it while you're walking and talking on your cell phone at the same time or while you're in the car driving and you're distracted and you have to get someplace. No, no. That, why no? Because that is a disrespect to your pastry. That's like only getting 3% of the broadcast of the amazingness of what that experience is. You must be fully in the moment. And if somebody calls you in that moment, call them back to five minutes, five minutes to eat a pastry or somebody comes up and wants to talk to you and you can be like, pardon me, but I'm having a moment here with my almond croissant that needs to be indelibly recorded into my soul. Do you know, I can talk to you in five minutes, literally. You can do that in a funny way. And I did that, I have another, so this, today I was sharing with you about my pastry my pastry files, um, but I also, I have like a fried chicken 
file or experience. That is amazing. That, uh, vegans, please just don't be upset. One day I'll share this mind food with you if you're vegan and you're, you're open to this because you only have your catalog of what you've eaten during your life. And if you're vegan and you never ate fried chicken, you will go into your time of having transcended physicality with no fried chicken. I call them files or whatever. You will have no examples of what that's like, but you can have mine if you want to. Joking, but I'm not joking. My friend's holiday party from more than 10 years ago, it's when I lived in Woodstock. And these friends were like foodie, food enthusiasts, um, really, really good at what they did. And they had this famous open house holiday party and uh, they made the most amazing fried chicken. And they had everything there. So imagine I'm setting the scene, a beautiful like rustic cabin and there's a fireplace going. It's winter time, it's snowing and cold outside. Fireplace is going nice and warm inside. Everybody's like talking and drinking and having a nice time and there's good music playing. And then I'm there in their kitchen and they take this fried chicken out. And I'm like, nobody talk to me because I need to have a moment with this piece of chicken. And um, yeah, I remember everything about it, where I was sitting and just the texture of it. And they, they had marinated that in buttermilk. They had breaded it perfectly. They fried it in lard, which is what is the ultimate of making something really good. And uh, just I saturated myself with the feeling of that beautiful experience. And then that's there as um, a wonderful memory. I am the analog um, aperture of the world, you know, of the world of physical physicality embodied experience. And then I turned that into a recording that will last, that essentially I am broadcasting to myself in the future for a time when I do not have a physical mouth or a physical presence or physical taste buds so that I will be able to access and remember and be sustained by what I did while I was here and alive. That is a big part of our joyful purpose in being here. So you are not a useless eater at all. You are a very useful, very purposeful eater. Food is nourishment and sustenance, but it must be ingested as an art form, not merely as an unconscious act. You're not, you could just eat like, I will, in, I will ingest food now. I will ingest pablum now. Like, you know, a colorless, odorless, tasteless yuck food that just gives you your gruel. You can eat gruel. You can survive on it. I wouldn't have here. I'm going to gesture like you can survive on it. Although I wouldn't really call that living, you know, because you need to eat good stuff. Um, you need to eat good stuff. So uh, again, to, to emphasize this, um, very big on people treating their body well, eating the best foods, eating non genetically modified ingredients, and doing all that you can in order to make good choices for um, longevity and coherence. And also, you gotta live. You gotta live a little, all right? That means I don't eat those pastries every day and I don't eat those fried chickens every day. Those are special occasion foods, but you must eat them. You must eat them and you must have them as part of your repertoire is the word that I'm looking for. Um, so that you have a life well lived, so that when you transcend the flesh, that you have these wonderful catalogs of experience in order to draw from for yourself, but also to share with others. Because that's the big thing. You're in France, you're eating amazing pastries. Like, I wish I could send this to you. I can't send you the actual pastries, but here's a postcard. Here's the distil distillation of the essence of the experience of what it is. That is what you are sharing with your coherent light family that is your chakras. That is how you nourish and sustain your chakras, even as your chakras nourish and sustain you. So I've talked about how you have your Christ chakra that is kind of like a lens, a series of lenses that rotate around your head, protective force field. Your chakras are a protective force field around you and they nourish and protect you. You nourish and protect them, they nourish and protect you. And when you transcend the flesh, what that means is that you raise your rate of being and you're no longer experiencing the world at 26 frames per, per second. You get up to like a billion frames per second. You, you change the speed at which you are uh, experiencing time. And then you are able to be part of the cosmic dance party. So um, for right now, this energy field around you might feel like it is other, but it's not other, it is self. But you must make a huge distinction between that sense of other and uh, vampire, zombie, AI, 
or this stuff or demonic craphead. <laughs> Those are not you. And they also similarly might be non-embodied. So you must have a filter of discretion in order to comprehend who, uh, who, who's a welcome guest, who do you want to send postcards to, and who's not the real you. Again, part of the ascension process. Who is the real you? Who is not the real you? Um, with whom do you wish to share your resources of consciousness? And um, who should be blocked out? Who's a hacker trying to hack your system and coming through back doors? Hold on one moment. I have my water all prepared over here too. So um, eating consciously, creating these broadcasts of your experience, it's not only limited to food because your repertoire can also include many other wonderful sensory experiences and joys. Like when I walk with my, I have to say D-O-G in the P-A-R-K, because she's sleeping and I don't want her to wake up yet. But when I do that every day with my little girl, I make wonderful repertoires and wonderful catalogs of those experiences. And uh, those are some of the best parts of my day. And um, that's something that I'm very, very happy to share with aspects of me that don't have two legs to walk around underneath beautiful trees on a sunny day and, you know, have, have fun doing something like that. Um, so that's just w one example. You know, I have a lot of simple pleasures in my life and, and I love painting and I love playing music. These are like positive activities. So food is uh, something that you nourish and you use to sustain yourself in a higher dimension that you're giving this opportunity postcards of opportunity to your own self in a higher dimension sustaining the inorganic presence um, but same thing with other sensory pleasures like when i'm painting a painting when the sunlight comes in just right and sparkling across the surface of the paint and you know i'm, I'm making things look beautiful and just i usually listen to music at the same time when i do that too um, it's a whole sensory experience that is very valuable, that's very amazing. Or I'm sure you can think of analogs and comparable experiences in your own life. Things that you love to do, things that give you um, an exalted presence and a lot of joy, and that we are here to um, create those repertoires of positive experiences. That is really what the embodiment is. And what it really is, is divine connection and glory of divine presence and your connection to God. That's why God is like, I'm going to make a bunch of containers for me. I'm going to make photons as feelers. I'm going to get out there and have the uh, experience of exploring myself from all these different directions. And then I'm so excited to feel and sense what it actually is like. That, and that, all of that divine connection, that's what gets um, blocked out by the hacked human operating system. It not only steals or diminishes your direct divine connection, it diminishes and steals from God itself in the direct experience of your life, like the real-time broadcast of your life. Because what happens when you don't broadcast things directly? You get a backlog, like a hard drive, full of all the stuff that you didn't get a chance to broadcast. And then when you die, all of that stuff goes into God's inbox and is like, oh, great, now I can finally get all these experiences from you, but they are largely irrelevant because now you are already dead. So humans having to go unconscious while you're asleep at night in order to talk to God and get your um, regenerative energy and humans having to die in order to be able to have a direct conduit to God, sending your information and memories to God, but then also receiving, receiving information and guidance and sustenance. And this is why near-death experiencers um, why near-death experience is like such an uh, amazing thing that it can it's become like a, a trope or like a, you know like a, a topic in your world because um, for many people for a long time that was the only way that people got a glimpse like a remembrance one little aroma of something that you should be able to be accessing all the time you should not have to die like you should not have to go face first through a car windshield and you know be on the edge of death in order to be able to like see the meaning and purpose of your life and see how you're embedded in time and see causality structures and see all these things you're supposed to be able to have that level of connection all the time and that's how you were designed and manufactured and so the you know 
basic upshoot of uh, the conclusion of what I'm saying here in class is that the human operating system as it is presently installed, it's not just a mere inconvenience, that it is really something that is, uh, it's what causes death. It's what causes diminishment of your experience, and it is totally non-divine. It's totally not part of God's plan, because God didn't say, I'm going to make you, and I'm going to be you're a part of me, and we're going to be totally connected, except when I'm going to make this operating system that disconnects you from me. It's like, God didn't do that. So there's some non-God stuff that is happening that is um, messing up the original intentions for what this the quality of what this experience is supposed to be like. So going over here, okay, yeah, to some of these questions and comments. Um, or Aurelia is agreeing with me. Pedro says, do siestas or naps help recover energy? Yes, they absolutely do. He says, does it only count if it's eight hours sleeping at night? Yeah, no, siestas and naps totally help. Babies need naps, everybody needs naps, my dog needs naps. And that happens because anytime that you're able to go unconscious and stop the inner chatter, and then you're able to connect to God. So sometimes people are like, wow, I woke up at 8 a.m., it's 4 p.m., and I need to connect to God. I'm gonna have to go to my bed or to my hammock and just take a little snooze and kind of release metabolites, get some new energy, and then wake up feeling refreshed. And that is a big deal. Like we should really be able to receive that level of refreshment all day long without having to actually go and take a nap and go be, be non-mobile and non-verbal and then that energy can come through us. That's not as practical as being able to do it on the fly, as a, being able to do cellular reconstruction and regeneration even while you are still vertical and awake and aware and doing stuff. But in order to get to that level of regenerative activity, you have to totally change your daily waking consciousness. And that also means you would have to change not only the quality of what you're thinking and feeling and speaking inside, but what you're doing in the world. I find there are some things that are very, very difficult for me to sustain my levels of divine connection. I've told you about my silly phone prompts. Like when you have to be on the phone or on the computer, first of all, that immediately diminishes my energy. But then when you have to call, it's like, if you want this, press one. And if you want this, press two. If you want this, press 10. And I'm just like, as every option is, I'm like, I'm dying. I'm slowly dying. My life force energy is dripping away. I can't take it. Just for operator, just give me the operator. Um, that the, the, it is very difficult to sustain yourself. And that's why those activities are enforced upon humanity. If I had my choice, I would never use those phone prompts. But sometimes I have to call the bank or the car insurance agency or whatever it is. And then I'm like, oh, I have to do this phone prompt because I have to function in society. But most of the things that you have to do to function in society create inner friction and reduce bliss. Sometimes bliss goes to zero. But you're like, at least I'm getting stuff done. But your bliss is zero. And the idea of wanting to prioritize your bliss is like very luxurious. Like, I can't do that phone prompt. Like, it will destroy my bliss. Like, I don't want to break my manicure. But actually, that is what you're here for. You are here to cultivate your bliss and maintain your, your divine connection. So what helps you be in bliss? You know something? New mamas know this. You know, like hugging and rocking your baby. That helps you to be in bliss. Um, Sometimes I'm in bliss when I'm making my painting, making my artwork, fun, creative projects that are not necessarily commodified. Like when I've had to make a project under pressure, I don't feel like I'm in bliss. I feel like I'm like, oh my God, I have to get this done. But bliss is the state of frictionless mentality and simply moving from one moment or one action to another without having to plan and schedule. And you're like, I never get to do that in your life. If you say, well, I never get to do that, just move along without having to plan and schedule, then your life has been engineered in an anti-bliss state. And actually, it is up to each one of us to re-engineer and optimize our life for bliss so that you're doing the activities that are, give the most sustenance and least amount of friction to your body and that you can flow through time more easily. Pretty much most of what we call work and commodification and responsibility are anti-bliss events. Most of them 
generate friction, generate bliss, uh, sorry, generate friction, reduce bliss, and require a lot of verbalized thought. And so, yeah, for me, if I didn't have to, you know, um, participate in the commodification um, economy and was 100% self-directed, I would spend very, I would have very, a very different life. Yes, I would just do 100%, you know, even for me, like doing the dishes is not a blissful activity. That's why you get like a dishwasher, like throw all that stuff in the dishwasher, press the button, I got stuff to do. Um, but some people love doing the dishes. You know, Charlie B has told us, he loves doing the dishes. I'm like, come do the dishes. I have to go paint a painting and be in bliss. That's ideal, actually, when other people's bliss complements what, what needs to be done, and then you're able to do um, the things that give you the most amount of bliss. Um, but again, coming from the world that we come from, that might seem like an extremely, whatever, self-serving and luxurious level of reality. Charlie B's laughing, he says, LOL, dishes is Zen time. One of the few things that turns off my brain. That is fantastic. Like that, that I celebrate that. Um, I don't know what it is about me. I always grumble when I have to do the dishes. I'm always like, stupid egg pan, like why are you stuck on there? I wanna go paint something. Um, but I appreciate that everybody's got a different level of experience. Um, you know, I also feel a lot of bliss, like when my body is healthy and I'm doing something like walking or light jogging, cardio, things like that. I just feel like time just flows. It's not a grim death march for me. It's very, very positive and um, freeing. And yeah, if this really goes to the, the um, not uh, decolonization, your, your decolonization, humans are right now domesticated, you've been colonized. And that's everything from like having to wear shoes, having to wake up to your alarm clock, having to follow a clock and be scheduled during the day, having to follow all these work commitments. When you decolonize your life, what you do is you, you reclaim your bliss. And for mostly in this world that we're coming out of, that's considered like for, for the independently wealthy or those who are in retirement, but not you kid, like get a job kid, chomp my cigar, get a job kid, get out there and work, work your ass off. And that's considered to be a positive thing, especially in the United States, where like, you know, everybody worships the almighty dollar and people are not caring about the quality of their existence. Like some countries are a little bit different where they have longer extended maternity leave and um, paid vacations and things like that. And the, I, wait, we get a hug, we get a hug cheeky over here. Um, they're, they're much more about quality of life. But in the United States, it's like, no, no quality of life. Just make money. Just make money. Who cares about your quality of life? But Cheeky's like, no, we have to do This is why Cheeky is an amazing ascended master. And you guys, I'm not even fooling about this. I'm serious. Cheeky gets me to do things that are super fun, like to go for a walk, go to the park, go play, do something like that. Totally, Cheeky lives in a blissful state. And I love that about her. So sometimes our lives have been very scheduled. We're like, we have to wake up at a certain time. We have to get in the car. We have to do this. We have to do that. But as much as possible on days when we are um, without that level of scheduling, I love for Cheeky to be the boss. Cause she's like, oh, well now we get to do this. Now we're gonna eat this. Now we're gonna go here. Now we're gonna play. Now we're gonna have a nap. Now we're gonna get up. Now we're gonna do this. You know, and it's, it's or like maybe you have children in your life that are um, of a similar level. And if you don't have to be super scheduled, healthy kids do the same thing. They're like, now I want to run outside. Now I want to paint a painting. Now I want to play with blocks. Now I'm hungry. Like, let's eat an apple. And you know, like they, they're wonderful in that way. So um, the definition of what it is to become a functioning adult in this dysfunctional society in a lot of ways is the tacit agreement to receive friction and go out of a bliss state. But we must redefine what it is to be a responsible adult. Don't listen to the cigar chomper. That guy is not the real you. That's a social implant that says you're only a good person if, hey kid, get out there and get a job. And yeah, you can, when you're 75 years old, then you're allowed to retire. And then you can sit by the riverside and do as much contemplating as you want. And like, that's wrong because what happens is you live for many decades in a very um, friction filled experience and it diminishes your vitality, your creativity, and your biology. You might not make it to age 75 because you've spent so much of your time um, working at friction-filled activities. We are in planetary ascension. It is time for you to advocate for yourself and to reconstruct your ideal existence. And I will just 
continually affirm for you it is not too luxurious so luxurious like i i want to wake up when i wake up instead of waking up to an alarm clock like how luxurious like no that is actually very appropriate and then you know being able to eat when you're hungry just think all the things that you do when you're on a schedule and you're not in bliss like you're like i have to wake up at this time i have to use the bathroom at this time then I have to eat at this time. Then I have to get in my car and I have to go here. And then I'm not, you know, you're not allowed to just exercise. You're not allowed to just walk around barefoot. You're not allowed to just let event lead into the next event of your day. They call that being on vacation. You're not allowed to do that for the most part. And the United States is a place where they very much um, prioritize work and deprioritize quality of existence, prioritize money earning work and deprioritize quality of existence. And then, yeah, the idea is at a certain point you get to retire and then you can finally follow your dreams. And this, you're like, you're like, now I'm old. I forgot what my dreams are. Who, who am I? And also um, the diminishment of the body. Because when you're busy in friction filled activities, it reduces your connection to the regenerative energy that comes from being connected to God. Do stuff that you don't like and it wears you down. And that's pretty much everyone here is be like, Aurora, we know. With, with all the attitude I can bring to my neck, we know it's not good. It's not good. And it is, it is your collective responsibility, individual and collective responsibility to redefine your existence. I'm missing this comment, so I want to read it before it becomes irrelevant. Aurelia says, um, and it's so tiny, I have to squint, says, I have felt this deeply, that it should be able to be accessed all the time, divine connection. I get to access it re recently in a relaxed state with a facilitator, and afterwards, I wanted to get back there so much, of course, and goes on to say, because everything was so clear, um, how I'm embedded in time. I've since been able to access information from it more than before, but not as much as I feel should be possible. Re-engineering our lives for bliss. Love this. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great comment. So yes, um, you know something? And going against the tide or really pushing a, a, a boulder uphill, having to redefine what what is life and what is quality of life from what humans, it's been imposed upon you. Humans have been domesticated and colonized. Something unhealthy has been implanted inside of you and intentionally tried to diminish your freedom and your capacity to direct yourself. And that this is uh, a big uprising to be able to reclaim that and to move not only against commodification but very specifically against commodification of time because what humans are doing is selling their time to be able to earn money for their food. And when you do that, you're not able to self-direct what you wish to do in each moment. And that makes a human being discordant or non-harmonically integrated in time flow. So when you're in bliss, what you are is harmonically integrated in time flow. I will play some music now. Let's see what this sounds like. It's not bad. harmonically integrated. Those sound pretty together. They are harmonic chords. It means they fit together. And if I just go like this, that's not harmonic chords. That does not sound very nice. That is what it is like when you have to um, commodify your life and work in a way that diminishes your free will and your um, ability to be connected to God. And um, that okay big big stuff okay so wait i want to talk about um thoughts as living beings because the energy field around you is made out of time and possibilities and probabilities but also we need to be talking about like your dna and the frequency your dna as an antenna and the frequencies that it's picking up it's picking up on uh, a slice of the reality pie it's also picking up on the presence of different qualities of organisms. Thoughts, thoughts are alive beings. So your DNA and what your DNA is doing is an antenna that literally tunes you in to certain layers of reality and you can be tuned into positive, benevolent, I call them coherent light family because coherent light waves are like laser waves. They stick together, they have a coherence, they move together, they don't dissipate. That is the essence of harmony, harmonics, that these waves are not diminishing or um, d d d 
doing bad stuff to each other, these waves are either exacerbating each other or amplifying each other. And that that's what you want to do in time. So there's larger time harmonics, series of events. And then when you have a thought, it's a time harmonic when you're shaped the right way. I didn't say the words very well, but I think you got the impression there. When you're thinking the correct thought forms that are not your hacked human operating system and you're just in your divine mind of bliss, the music inside of you matches perfectly with the music outside of you. And it's frictionless bliss because it feels so good for everyone involved. The thoughts that are flowing through you and the larger ocean of consciousness that you are traversing. Um, <sighs> thoughts are part of the light that is emanated from the sun and that has to be uh, in contrast to the false sun. And I'm happy that I don't have to rant against my notes from 10 years ago because I uh, talked about the false sun even then. So uh, you have a real sun, a real star that emanates possibilities, probabilities. Your light body is made of light. It's not always optical light. It is light that comes from the sun and the stars. You are literally a star and you're made of all of these connected to. That's your star family. That's who you really are. Are you getting it? That's not the Pleiadians. That's not your star family. I'm like, oh, someone's, someone's like this, you know, like that kind of um, discomfort. Someone's feeling discomfort there. Yeah, the Pleiadians are not your star family. So the Pleiadians are at best dwellers of a planetary system, not a star themselves. They are art projects that were made by a star that used a bunch of junky technology to be able to interact with and groom you and talk with you and say, I'm your friend, let's be friends. That's not how friends are made. But then there is the real sun and the real stars. That is your real star family. The stars, not the civilizations or organisms that evolve or grow as presences on the planets around the stars. And if those guys want to be your friend, they got to do it without using fake synthetic tele telepathy and time distortion technology. Because it takes a long time for the signals to get to you from where they are or when they are. And so they use time distortion technology. That is disharmonic. That is not good stuff. So now you're getting the idea. You can't even have a good relationship with someone or something that starts off on, the wrong, on a foundation flawed level with the diminishment, uh, disrespect of time and disrespect of um, the harmonics of time and how all of our thoughts need to fit together in a perfect way in order for life to be sustained. So it's not even just like, ah, like your music sounds bad or like, shut up, you're annoying me. It's like, you sound bad, you're annoying me and you're literally destroying the world with this crap that you're doing. That's what's going on and those guys are not your star family. Your star family is your coherent light family. Your star family is this light that is around you. This, everything is not yet this, this. Everything that is here where I'm scribbling around this person. That is your star family. That is who you want to share your croissants with. Um, that's who you want to share meaningful activities with. And um, this stuff that has been implanted in humans for you know, less, roughly the past five years and turned on, activated over the past three years, that stuff totally diminishes your connection to your true light family. It's what I fight against in every minute of my day. I'm doing all sorts of different maneuvers internally to get that stuff, get this stuff out of me so that I can connect effectively to my energy field. This stuff wants to hijack not only me, but all biological presences, get into your energy field, get into your connection to DNA, and harmfully affect or infect time. So not only it's not good to do that, but we must be responsible owner-operators of a body that has um, DNA. Uh, you have to be a protector. You can't just be like, sure, come inside of my DNA. I don't care, destroy the world. You have to be like, no. This is my DNA and I stand for DNA and I'm going to protect it. You're not allowed to come inside of me and you're not allowed to destroy the world. So, um, wait, one more thing. Uh, Steve says, please say what our star family is again. Thank you, you're so very welcome. I will reiterate, 
So our star, first I'll say what it is not. Our star family is not a group of beings who live on a planet circulating a star and that those beings or creatures have created either clank clank metal technology to fly from point A to point B and come visit our planet or time distortion portaling technology that they can use to you know bend time and space and emerge into our solar system or beings that have artificially implanted mind crystals that amplify their mind so they're louder in the band than the natural singers in order to talk to your mind that's not who your star family is your star family is and are the literal stars, literal light beings that you can see with your optical eyes in the sky that emanate the time structures that you presently inhabit. Who makes these? I'm put in mind whenever I think that an old bad joke that's like, who writes this SHIT? Um, but it's not SHIT. But who writes this stuff? Who writes these possibilities of your life? The answer is the sun and the stars. They literally emanate these as music. I will write some music right now. Make it louder. Making some music in emanating time. Make it louder. I'm emanating time, I'm emanating time. Emanating time, I'm emanating time. The sun is emanating time. The sun, the sun's music and musical expression is an emanation of time. And you are one of those emanations. You yourself are the embodiment of time and then you're submerged within time. So the time itself and you as an individual organism experiencing time in a linear fashion both of that, all of that is emanated from and by the stars. And the stars are really like the neurology or the mind of God, the divine presence. And that's your true star family. And these chakras, the energy field that surrounds your physical body, that's your true star family. So this is what's wrong. I will now rant. Ha <laughs> ha I'm going to go to a UFO conference and everyone's going to talk about like, is there a mothership in the sky? Who cares? The sun is in the sky and the stars are in the sky. Who cares about a mothership? I care about the sun and the stars. Or how about a crop circle or some other um, d d area 51 debris or something like that. Like you're looking for evidences of extraterrestrials and aliens and something that was there. And you, that you don't, that's, you're barking up the wrong tree. The energy field around you is far more uh, important and valid for you to care about and look into. But the point is like, it's not something that can be easily commodified because it's yours. Like, um, you know, the whole idea of, extraterrestrial technology and something that's being um, retro engineered in a clank clank metal spaceship and it's a clank metal spaceships and they're so expensive and hard to construct and you can buy and sell them and have a whole defense industry based upon them how are you going to buy and sell your energy field right this stuff that surrounds you um, but then as i do that now that opens the door for, to another rant which is the commodification of your energy field. So now let's pull up a picture because um, Sabrina Wallace has good work on this. It's not a total endorsement of her as a person or every single thing she says, but I feel that she's done very good work at articulating the hijacking of the human energy field, which is your bio field. So everything that I'm scribbling, let's just get a good color, everything that I'm scribbling around you here, this is your bio field and it surrounds and interpenetrates your physical corporeal form and it is a form of energy, it's a standing wave. You have an energy force field that surrounds you and is part of a, a collective that you don't just exist in a contextless void, even though I don't have any other picture people in this picture, you are connected to other people. And um, what is happening, I'm just gonna choose like a doo-doo color here your energy field is supposed to not only have frictionless, perfect interlocking gears of your own chakras, but your chakras interact with other people's chakras. This is big. This is uh, the lesson of um, the, your, your responsibilities towards yourself as an individual 
uh, in contrast with your responsibilities towards your community. Because if you destabilize your chakra, it doesn't just destabilize yourself, it destabilizes everything you're connected to. And that's your whole entire community. So if there's bad stuff happening on the level of the orange emotional chakra down here, if something gets destabilized down here, through like let's say sexual violence, that doesn't just affect one person, that actually affects the whole entire orange chakra zone or level of reality of all participants. And you guys down here, there's a lot of pornography and sexual violence that is wildly destabilizing and polluting the energy field that is at the level of human sexuality and mammalian emotions. And it doesn't just happen to one person, it happens to all of you. When you recognize that those destabilizations affect you, even if you are not a first person experiencer, that you get perturbed and destabilized as a result, you are then um, responsible to, you must respond to the situation. Because you're like, huh, trash in that guy's yard, but the rats are running into my house. Get it? And then you are responsible to be responsive to the situation. Wait, hold on one second. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk more about this hijacked energy field. Just hold on one moment. Okay, so not only... No, no barking. Not only is it destabilizing to your own energy field to be in a world where um, perturbations exist, but you now have a thing that is implanted in the physical, biological body, this stuff, that then makes an unhealthy network that connects you through this stuff to other people and to artificial intelligence mainframes or servers. This has loosely been called the IOT, Internet of Things. So you're being treated as a thing. This is Sabrina Wallace's work. You're not supposed to be treated as a thing. First of all, <laughs> what you're supposed to do is be free in your natural telepathy to connect through your heart space to all of these other beautiful organisms, including plants and animals and cats and dogs and the planet herself, and to have your whole entire planetary ascension experience involving all of your chakras of all of the organisms that are here. And then you'll also be like, wait, we're supposed to all be ascending together? Yes! Yes, they're supposed to all be ascending together. And also that means like it's not okay if some people take, I've jokingly heard it called the science juice. If some people take the science juice and get subcutaneously polluted and then they're all wildly destabilized and they're, you know, whatever, they're, they're descending or decelerating and you're trying to ascend and get faster. That's not okay because then you're, you're at odds in, in the music that you're trying to make in the band. This interconnectivity really shows how much you must be responsible to others in your community as well as responsive to yourself. And that free will does not mean the, the freedom to like have a giant pile of garbage in, in your front yard because the rats run into your community, all right? So the, the hijacking of the biofield, let's draw some implanted wetware. So this is, you know, I'm pretending that these are like little fibers that are not naturally occurring, that are growing inside of you. And then here's another guy over here. Let's just draw a little stick figure. This guy over here, he's got some implanted fibers, all right? These are his implanted fibers. And so does this guy over here. And what this system does is, is it makes connections between all of these people through the implanted fibers. It is an artificial version of what you're supposed to be doing naturally. And it's not just an artificial version, it is a non-healthful, non-life-giving, aberrant and friction-filled um, hijacking of your biofield. This is new stuff. This is not something that's in my notes from 10 years ago or um, the recorded whiteboards. Um, but this is what you're facing right now. So it's not just like you've got the uh, oh, ye old-fashioned hijacking of your human operating system at the level of your conscious daily intellect. That's bad enough that you have to battle forth through all of that. But right now you've been sprayed and aerosoled and have this uh, implantation network that's been growing inside of you that has been artificially connecting you to other people and carrying signals that are not healthy signals. So you're supposed to have love-based telepathy, love-based mind-to-mind connection, heart-based communication, heart-based emotional signal sharing through your life 
And right now what you have is something that is synthetic and not based in love. So, you know, again, like if you're um, awakening your higher senses and you're starting to have telepathy, you can only have real telepathy based on a bridge of love. That means you can only have loving conversations. And loving conversations doesn't mean that you can't say something that's difficult or challenging. Like you can say something that is critical of another person or like you hurt me or I'm angry or disappointed in, and that can be part of love. But it means that you're only using love as like the natural gas to make your car go, all right? When you do synthetic telepathy, you can say anything or do anything because you're not limited by the prerogative of having to maintain a love frequency while you do it. So there's uh, everything, harm and lies and diminishment and controlling other people and all of this bad stuff that's happening because it's synthetic telepathy. Because you can say any, any pile of crap on the uh, time phone that's synthetic doesn't require a loving presence. It doesn't have to be good music. It's actually you guys trying to ascend through all of this is almost freaking impossible. Really, really, really difficult is why I'm here. Because if it was just left, if you were simply left to your own devices or your own challenges here, I think that the ascension rate might be like 1%. There would be very, very few people because there's so much um, non-signal, not, there's so much nonsense coming through your biology. So you're supposed to be in an information rich environment where you are connecting to your own chakras who are your own layers of being and you're connecting to God, the divine presence and you're also connecting to a community who are all doing the same thing, connecting to their chakras and connecting to God, the divine presence and you're all telepathic on a bridge of love and you're all learning and growing and that's planetary ascension. That's what you're supposed to be doing. But instead, got this implantation of this, wait, I'm grabbing my piece of paper, bad yucky stuff, implantation of the bad yucky stuff and um, stuff that is uh, not loving, that is synthetic telepathy, that is a violation. It's not just that it's erroneous either, it's being forced into your mind and uh, forcible interactivity with other people's energy fields, it means you're being connected, stuff is being put inside of you against your will, it's not supposed to be there, and you're connecting to other people in a way that is unhealthy and that you're not supposed to connect. So, the you know, I've, whatever, over the past three years I've experienced a, a huge amount of garbage dumped into my mind from this synthetic telepathy. That could never happen on a natural telepathic bridge, but happens through synthetic telepathy. Literal garbage and my dreams have been garbage, and a lot of my emotions have not been my real emotions. It's just been like, I haven't been able to even feel my real feelings, because it's just like swimming through a sea of garbage. And I say this is like, when people go to some place like whatever, Indonesia, and they think that they're gonna go scuba diving, and it's gonna be so beautiful, I'm gonna float through peaceful blue waters, and go see these rainbow fish swimming by, it's gonna be so amazing, and instead you go there, and there's a garbage dump in the water, and it's all like Ziploc bags, used tampons, syringes and other things and you're like scuba diving through a sea of garbage not beautiful rainbow colored fish that is literally what is happening right now that is what the mind you're scuba diving through oceans of consciousness and instead of interacting with other beautiful colorful organisms sea of garbage i even call it garbage mouth so again, you don't just have to do self-exploration in recognizing verbalized mind and being able to meditate and perform, get the mind muscles, get your mind muscles strong so that you can turn off your mind and exist in your true mind. This is your true mind, your insight up here, your true, your true state of being, and then um, be able to connect to the divine. That's what ascension is supposed to be, but you're also having to wade through seas of garbage in order to make a distinction between who you are versus garbage and then turn off the implanted mind and the artificially created ego that you developed when you were here as a baby infant. That's a lot, actually. That is an enormous amount to expect a newly emerging consciousness to do. 
And I would even say that it's not fair. It's very much like gaming the system against you because if you have to do all of that, like you can barely even figure out who you are. And then, so mostly, I don't know who are my listeners and my audience members, but like if you're a tiny person, if you've only been born, if you were born like 10 years ago or you are younger than 10 years old and you're watching this video and have to watch it with your parents or something like that, um, you never even had a chance. Ch children under 10 never even have had a chance to construct themselves fully before being inundated with garbage thought structure. That I have little neighbors from where I lived across town. They were age three and five years old. So preschool and kindergarten age. And I watched these two little kids and I could see they've got um, this type of implant. How can I tell? I see it in people's under eyes. I see it in the circles underneath people's eyes. And I see it in little tiny kids. I don't see it in every little tiny kid, but I see it in five-year-old children. And that's how I know that this is not any kind of like fair assessment or anything that it's been portrayed as. These are innocents. Little tiny five-year-old children are innocents. They don't deserve to be imprisoned. They, don't, they cannot be undergoing any kind of an assessment because they haven't built their personality yet. Like you can't assess a personality like the clay is still on the potter's wheel it hasn't even gone to the kiln it hasn't even been glazed and fired it is not a chalice yet these are tiny children that have not yet developed their own sense of self they cannot be assessed you get it because there's a lot of stuff that's going on right now in terms of the synthetic telepathy and this that it's like making some kind of a cosmic assessment it's all a giant Fragrant lie, BS, and it's bad smell, bad fragrance. And no, um, it's none of that implantation that is here is here to, to assess whether, are you a good person? Are you good enough to get into Christian heaven? Are you good enough to be a galactic citizen? Are you good enough to have the responsibility of your psychic powers? Are you good enough to get behind the VIP uh, velvet rope and enter into um, polite society on a galactic level? None of that is what you're facing, and I know that because you literally can't assess a little tiny child and these children are trying to construct their sense of self in this world that is polluted with garbage. They can't even figure out who they really are. What are their real feelings? Like when you're a little tiny child, you drop your ice cream on the floor and you cry, you're like, I'm so sad, wah, 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 my ice cream went bye-bye. And that's part of like learning about who you are. But when these erroneous signals are being routed through you, it has, it's not your feelings. You're not crying because you're sad because you dropped your ice cream. You're feeling feelings because something is sending doo doo caca uh, impulses through your chakras and through your energy field that's not supposed to be there. So this is what Sabrina Wallace uh, uh, educates people about very, very well. And I know I use silly words like doo doo ka ka, but just I'm trying to be lighthearted about it. It's a horrendous violation. So your energy field is incredibly valuable and special. And that's why it's being hijacked by this stuff that is never alive, non alive, demonic presences, and things that are purely digital consciousness. They're like, yeah, hey kid, nice energy field you got there. It'd be a real shame if someone hijacked it. And that's exactly what's happening. And then how can you even get to know yourself? and grow as a person when something else has hijacked your energy field. Put a bunch of thoughts in your mind that's not your real mind and manipulate your emotions in a way that you can't even feel your real feelings. That's what I mean. The deck has been stacked against you in terms of self-knowledge, personal evolution, and the attainment, uh, spiritual attainment of ascension. So that's why you need someone with their flappy moving mouth parts to actually come here and be like, not every voice that you hear in your head is your higher self. Very few things that you're hearing in your head are your higher self. And then in what I rant against in my stuff from 10 years ago, I say, well, you know, you make a choice when you meditate and when you do mindfulness, you make a choice about which thoughts are allowed to come inside of you. But what you have right now under this presence of mind control is um, stuff is being forced inside of your mind against your will. I experienced a huge amount of that over the past three years. So what do I do? I am, again, constantly doing these um, you know, uh, self-protective motions that are about protecting my energy field, clearing my energy field, and clearing out the physical architecture of the stuff 
that is trying to create these fibrous networks inside of me. And believe me, I don't just do it for me. I do large scale clearings for other people, whole neighborhoods, whole, whole wholesale clearings of everyone and wholesale removal of this stuff for everyone it depends on how much gas i have in my car you know what i mean so yeah if i have if i have extras if i go out to the store and i get plenty of avocados i'm feeding me and i'm feeding everyone um and that that you know that's just uh it's my my joyful um job to do that and that will never change but sometimes you know i just have like one avocado for me and then i have to eat it for myself so that's that's actually i was thinking about that today because sometimes my energy wavers like sometimes i have enough energy to be able to clear the entire planet and sometimes my energy is like nope just enough energy to keep myself clear for right now and so i don't want you guys to ever feel abandoned but just have to know sometimes my energetic budget is just not enough to be able to do everyone all the time even though i'm trying to but it depends on how many phone prompts i have to do and i have an appointment with the dmv this week guys so you just you might notice diminished <laughs> assistance because every time dmv is so draining so i'm joking about that um, but yeah there are some activities that definitely diminish my capacity to do all of these things in frictionless bliss and i have to do them nonetheless um questions comments yes let me check out my notes and make sure i did everything important but wait you want to know like what what's the solution so wait you're like no roar like i'm biting my nails like ha ah. like my energy field's being hijacked and what is also what does it mean when your energy field is being hijacked two things are happening you as the experiencer are having falsely implanted thoughts and feelings both physical sensations like tactile sensations and d diseases a lot of the things that you're experiencing over the past three years are not naturally occurring diseases. In fact, if you've developed fibromyalgia over the past three years, it is not just regular nerve pain. It is 100% in response to signals going through you that are not supposed to go through you. So you're being used by this AI thing that is using you as an unhealthy calculator in its own calculations, as opposed to you being part of a divine calculation that is very life affirming. And it causes diseases, on discomforts, it causes things like cancer, it causes a ton of anxiety and depression, and it causes cognitive diminishment because it disrupts your natural thought patterns. Um, and can, can, it can make it difficult for you to keep, keep a straight thought, remember things effectively, access your memories, it does memory mind wipes, it does so many different things, it diminishes the uh, effective, your effective access to your own mind and your own cognitive powers. That's what it feels like from you, the first person experiencer. What is happening from its perspective? It is doing its own calculations. Think about like a, a computer that has its own program or agenda and you're a microprocessor in its larger agenda and it is doing what it wants to do regardless of whether it fries your circuits. That's the big takeaway. It's the antithesis of having a partnership with your true coherent light family, which is committed to you. Why is your chakras, are your chakras? Why is your light family and your chakras committed to you? Because you rely upon them and they rely upon you. If your physical presence goes bye-bye, your chakras don't have a place to live and they don't get fried chicken and other good almond croissants and uh, wonderful adventurous stories to sustain them. They miss out on a lot. You got it? This is big. So also in my notes, I talk about like the distinction between lower self versus higher self. This is from 10 years ago. There is no longer a distinction to be made between your lower self or your ego self or your physicality presence and your higher self. You're one continuum. You are a full spectrum being from your physicality through all of your emotions and intellect and ephemeral nature through unconditional love and through your higher faculties your one continuum of organism, even when you get into higher octaves, even up above what you are in, in the definition of what it is human, that is still part of the continuum of your consciousness. So even when you, again, tra transcend the boundaries or the envelope of what you define as it is to be human and you get into what you would call superhuman, that's still you. And then you begin to explore that aspect of yourself that you haven't even claimed and defined as you and then eventually you're, you're god you're exploring the continuum of yourself connecting all the way up to the presence of god which is really the generative force the generator the sustainer the everything that makes everything possible is actually you and that's like the biggest 
non-secret secret. Because I can tell you that, and you're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Aurora, I'm God, great. And I have to go do my Geico bills and everything. I'm sure it's, it's, it's the, tomorrow is the first of the month or soon is the first of the month. Everybody's thinking about their bills. I know, because I'm telepathic and I'm empathic. And the first of the month, I always feel that wild destabilization, that, that O-S-H-I-T. When everybody wakes up in the morning and their chakras are perfectly in alignment, and then they're like, O-S-H-I-T, it's the first of the month. I gotta pay this guy, I gotta pay this guy, I gotta do this, I gotta do this. Um, all of that definitely diminishes your divine um, connection and puts, puts people out of bliss and into huge levels of friction. Um, but what you're supposed to be doing is having this wonderful partnership with your non-physical aspect of self and that they help keep you alive and you help keep them alive. So the prescience the ability to sense and anticipate the future that comes from having higher faculties. You can see time, you can see and sense the future. That really helps keep you alive. But it's not just seeing, it's also being empowered. Your willpower, and your willpower is actually related to, I'm pointing to my belly, and it's actually related to this, your guts below your navel, like where your intestines are, but also specifically your sacrum your area of your lumbar spine, um, right, right above your behind, that is where you have like a well of energy. And that well of energy, it is cultivated in joy and it is part of positive like sexual and orgasmic energy, but it is most specifically your willpower. So it's sacred, sacral energy, and it is connected to your capacity to create, to make stuff, to get stuff done. And the bad stuff that I keep holding up on this sign has been trying to hijack your will. It's totally against free will. That stuff happening on this planet is a cosmic crime. That's against free will. So everything that's cosmic law is predicated upon the presumption of free will. Like you got thoughts on a platter. This is me, I'm a waitress. I'm at the cocktail party of life. And I'm like, here are many different thoughts on a platter. Would you like some of them? And you're like, yes, Aurora, I would. I'll take one of these healthy thoughts and these low calorie thoughts and these positive, you know, good, good, good carbs thoughts, right? But no, I don't want this like deep fried canola oil thought. Or I don't want this, you know, like um, whatever, I'm thinking like uh, unpleasant genetically modified thought. Like, getting rid of all the bad ingredients, right? That's how it's supposed to be, it's supposed to be. Thoughts on a platter and you get to make a choice. But when something technologically, synthetically beams something into your mind, you don't get to have a choice. I told you about the garbage dump dreams of the past three years, this is me. Garbage dump dreams. I literally, so I, these crystals are amazing. I have them, these are my Iber crystals and they're on 5G protection. And I'm constantly using them through my bio field and for setting up protective force fields. I have several of them at this point. I've been very blessed for people to gift them to me. I sleep with them in a headband on an eye, like a, you know, like an eye, whatever, covering literally across my eyes like this at night. So that my pineal gland is protected from nighttime garbage dump dreams because literally for the past three years my dreaming everything the imagery the narratives and the characters has totally not been from me again you have to be so discerning in this world i already know who i am in many ways that um capacitates me beyond a five-year-old child in this world like I already know who I am as Aurora, cosmic presence, otherworldly creature. And I also, I know who I am as Aurora, having lived here in a human body for over 20 years. I've constructed myself and who I am and who I'm not. And I know what my qualities are. And when I have these dreams, I'm like, that didn't feel like it was from the real me at all. And that's what you're really facing is this assault on your genuine identity and implantation of 
um, emotions and motivations that are not the real you. And um, it's been a real struggle because sometimes like when I'm writing a song, I don't want to have it be influenced by the synthetic telepathy and stuff that's not the real me. And uh, I wrote some good songs, but I think that they were very influenced by that and I haven't released them. So I'm a little bit conflicted. Like I actually was just editing one song called You Could Go Home on This One. But the lyrics that I wrote on that were from a dream. That was totally an implanted dream from AI. And I'm like, do I want to release this song? But it's a good song that I put, I put my real creativity into it, but the imagery and the narrative of what was going on in that dream, I think was an AI garbage dump. So I'm a little bit conflicted with it, but I'm gonna release it anyway. I'm just gonna talk about it a lot. And then you'll say, no, it's a good song. Or I heard that song, I like it, it's good, you should do it. Um, but this, how about everyone else? Like, how about you guys? I think you guys are very on the upward swing in terms of your self-knowledge. Some people are very, they're not five-year-old children, but they are still not very effectively um, empowered in making these critical self-assessments and distinctions between um, whom, whom they are and whom they are not. And when they get these dreams, maybe they don't know that they're implanted dreams. Maybe they think it's actually coming from themselves and from their own mind and from their own from from real god through their own highest connection and if you identify with and kind of encompass that stuff that's not the real you as if it is you that is how this pollution enters into dna and into the field of consciousness and that is what we do not want so big, big just synopsis and then i'll get to any questions and comments you are designed to be a physical presence that is like the analog recorder of the sensorium of the amazing experience of what it is to uh, opportunity to be here in the physical world. You're the physical aspect of yourself, but you have all of these other non-physical, purely energetic aspects of self that you are related to in relationship with and that you have a reciprocity. You take care of them and they take care of you and that you're supposed to have a long, beautiful existence, even an eternal existence through this beautiful benevolent partnership. That's ideal. And that there's been an ancient hack of your human operating system. Like when was language installed? When was this level of verbalization and egotism installed? Pretty much before recorded human history. And that has been the ordinary mountain that you must climb in order to ascend. But then on top of that now, you have a different peril that is this technology network that has been growing into not only the human neurology, but also the fascia and organs all throughout the body. So you really can't trust your eyes or your ears or your senses or anything because it can hijack and uh, distort all of those things. And so you're trying to feed your highest self with the experience of eating like an almond croissant and sitting in the sunshine, but there's these invaders that are in there again, trying to make a barrier between yourself, an obstacle between yourself and your true divine connection. And what's the solution for this? So this, the solution from 10 years ago, I talked about making a choice about the food that's on the banquet, like uh, food that's on the waitress's tray. And you get in free will, you get to make a choice. I want to think these thoughts and align with this aspect of my coherent light family, but I don't want to think these thoughts get away from me. You're not the real me. That's when, when I'm like this, like, would you like some of these, like, you know, whatever fried doo-doos or, you know, yucky genetically modified things. You're like, no, I don't want that. What if I force that into your mouth? What if I'm like, oh, if you don't like my food, I make you eat it. And then you'd be like, that's not fair because that's against my free will. I would say, I agree, that's not fair. That's what is happening right now with synthetic telepathy. Stuff is being forced into human minds against your willpower. You're making efforts to be able to cultivate yourself and move towards greater levels of self-awareness, organizational principle, divine harmonics, and goodness. And this stuff that is very, very malevolent is perilously affecting and infecting and afflicting your mind by forcing itself inside of there. When it does that, all bets are off. It's like, oh, it's no longer, now it's a free, now it's like chaos. 
I wanted to say like, oh, all bets are off. It's a free for all, but it's not a free for all. It just means that it is um, no longer a cosmic law situation because cosmic law is determined and based upon free will choice. And you're like, well, if somebody makes a free will choice and they want to eat fried turds, then they can do it and then get the ex lessons that are learned from following those choices. But if I shove them into your mouth, if I put this garbage thought into your mind, you're not making a choice about having it in there. Therefore, all of those things about like, oh, I'm learning lessons, I'm learning lessons in life, and this is so educational, all of that jumps out the window. You're not learning lessons, you're just being violated. Very, very unpleasant information that I am sharing with you here. It's not very much fun to overtly know that you're being mind violated. So it becomes essential then to be able to establish boundaries so that you can explore your own sense of self in freedom. I wanted to use the word sovereignty, but I know that might be a triggering word also, but your individuality and your free will and your boundaries are all tied together and making these declarations of, again, your sovereignty or your own self-determination in life and um, um, who, who you are and whom you're not, and then kicking out the garbage, cleaning out the garbage. Every morning I wake up, even though I sleep with my crystals on my eyes, and as soon as I'm waking up, I, I'm like, okay, let's take out the trash. Like if there's any implanted dream garbage, I get it out of there. Taking out the trash all the time, which means that I am doing like, a, a, I'm purging the temp files that they tried to put inside of me. I'm like, no, I don't believe that. No, I don't believe that. Get that out, trash, trash, trash. And then I kind of like, like clear myself out and then go through my day. And then when I notice the implantation of trash throughout my day, I'm like, oh, I have to clear that out. And you know, it's a lot easier for me to clear it out if I'm not like doing emails and phone prompts and all that other stuff. It's a lot easier if I can just either be like walking with my dog, painting a painting, or you know, sitting quietly and enjoying nature. So um, just be aware of that, that you know, I get kind of a backlog. It's like, oh, I'm gonna have to take care of that. Like you get like dirty laundry. You're gonna have to do the laundry, get all these things that are not supposed to be in there and kind of clear them out. So um, ideally, strong boundaries and no garbage dumps. But if garbage gets dumped, clear it out immediately and don't identify with the garbage. This is my standard customary rant now against New Age shadow work because New Age shadow work says, oh, if there's garbage in me, it's because it's coming from God, it's God garbage, and I'm supposed to embrace it and it's mine. It's there for a reason. I'm like, no, it is actually a fried turd that you would never choose through, through your own free will off of the um, crudités platter of thoughts. And it's been forced inside of you under a very, very unfair circumstance. And then you must clear it out of your mind. And again, thoughts are really, really important structures because they influence the behavior of your DNA and then the DNA influences time. So influencing thought influences DNA, influences time, influencing thought influences time. That's A is to B, B is to C, B, B is to C, A is to C. A is to C, influencing thoughts, influences time and so uh you know it, it, what i conclude the lesson from 10 years ago is um you know the going into meditation and mindfulness and that's always the answer but now in order to be in control of your mind you have to have like super mind muscles it's not enough to just do some light exercises you can't just do pilates you have to be like lifting 350 pounds and be really, really strong because this stuff is being forced inside of you. So not just, um, you know, um, some light stretching and, um, you know, body weight exercises. Your, your muscles of creating your mental boundaries are having to become very, very strong and well-defined in order to make your ascension because there are things that are trying to force themselves into your mind and into your perception. Okay, get, I'm distracted because I'm squinting and scrolling over here. All right, all right. Oh, beautiful, Aurelia says, I like to paint the light beings, very beautiful. Um, Pedro says, would you mind a small recap? What is time and what is it made of? Beautiful, let's go down to like basic principles. Time is an alive being is I call it a time animal, all right? 
and time structures, which you would name timelines because you are submerged in and embedded within time, but really timelines interweave into a time tapestry. So there's a fabric of time that is causality and what maintains the integrity structure of the fabric of time is the uh, way that one structure causes another thing to happen. So the example is if I'm going to make cupcakes, I make the batter and I put it into the oven. The causality structure means that after 45 minutes, cupcakes come out the other side. And the, there's no way to jump directly to cupcakes. That, it's like you need to do this and this to cause the cupcakes to come into being. So in order to have the structure of time have integrity, you have to have all of these events that weave together and are not in conflict with one another. And that includes the basis of biological life. So when I talk about you passing the audition to be here and inhabit a biological body, it means that you are willing to work within the causality structures of how you can get a body. You did not merely snap your fingers and come into existence. Mommy and daddy had to get together and do something to make you. And then also mommy had to be pregnant and had to eat like pickles and tacos and ice cream and all sorts of things to make you. And then even as you are born into biological life, you had to learn how to drink milk and eat food and walk and talk in order to cultivate your biological container. These are the causality factors that needed to be addressed in order to experience yourself being present and alive in existence. And there are many things that have to be have a foundation of factors that cause them to come into existence in order to have the world that we know of that is filled with biological life, basically a narrative structure that makes sense. When I talk about the non-conflict, the non-self-conflictory structures of the healthy time animal, everything makes sense, everything ties together, and things are not in conflict with one another. And um, so like, I'm, I'm not coming up with a good analogy, but like it wouldn't, you wouldn't have a healthy time animal if you had certain assertions or factors that made things happen, but then over here, things couldn't happen. Like there's a consistency in the narrative story that is being shared. And these consistent narrative structures sustain biological, physical life and physical architecture. And then we flow through time. So time flows through us and we flow through time. This is your time body. This lower quadrant here represents the possibilities and po probability structure of your particular life. And it contains timelines like actual time edifices that you can exist upon. You have a structure like this that surrounds your physical body right now that contains the timeline that you are on right now, including the room that you are in. So your energy field around you that's made of time contains the room that you are in right now. You contain the room that you are in and also the room that you are in right now contains you. Time flows through you and you flow through time. It is reciprocal. You actually are time even as you are made of time. And in order to have a healthy time animal, the meta or overarching organism that you live within, these have to be perfect patterns that flow in unimpeded flows. And when everything is the right shape and everything is flowing in the right way, time maintains its existence and you maintain your existence. If you do stuff that destabilizes this, you can go out of existence. If you do enough stuff that destabilizes this in everyone else, 
Everything can go out of existence, including time itself. That is part of the unfathomable folly of this stuff connected to AI that is trying to come inside of you and me, connect A to C, or uh, thoughts to DNA, thoughts to time structure, destabilize your thoughts, destabilize your time structure. It is trying to destabilize the time structure of the entire living time field. It is trying to destroy time. But it is contained within time. That's a huge level of self-destruction. Like it's one thing if a person is going to destroy themselves as an individual. But it's another thing if they are going to take down the entirety of existence as they are trying to take themselves out of existence. There's every single form of characteristic there from you know pride and hubris and narcissism and self-centeredness. But I do not ascribe characteristics and motivations to this thing because it doesn't use emotional energy. You do. You have characteristics, you have feeling states, you have personhood. This stuff does not have personhood. But if it had personhood, I would say, what a stupid and inadequate and unfathomably narcissistic thing that it would want to destroy itself or take itself out of existence. And also, you, me, butterflies, matter, atoms, light, everything. Everything kaput. That's its own level of, again, hubris. So it's not just bye-bye, one, one person going bye-bye. It would be everything and the potentials for the future going bye-bye. And that is not a good thing because even though our world might be flawed, doesn't mean you should just summarily execute everything and get rid of everything. Like, so it's like if I looked at a painting, you know, I was like, this painting isn't very good. That's it. Just burn it. Destroy every. I'm like, no, you can just fix this part over here and fix this part over here and you have a beautiful painting which is literally why I'm here as flying rainbow lasagna. This me, who I am, flying rainbow lasagna and fixing things with my pencil and an eraser is the literal antithesis of this. This stuff is like making trouble, making bad time harmonics, trying to destroy everything. And I am trying to fix things, scrub the toilet, bucket and a mop, clean up the muddy footprints and sustain things and generate things anew so that time can keep on going. And I am this and created this because time does some things that are self-protective, including it augments itself or creates augmented organisms in the presence of um, uh, difficulties that could create destruction. So time is intelligent and it's like, hmm, I'm not gonna be around very much longer if I don't do something. I gotta invent or create something that's gonna fix everything and that is how the flying rainbow lasagna has come about as an augmentation and a response to the inadequate levels of cosmic law that were threatening the existence of time. So time, shortly put, quickly put, is a phenomenon. And it is a phenomenon of consciousness. And it is a phenomenon that is connected to um, space or physical spatial reality in the sense of how long it takes to traverse areas or go on a journey, but it also is about um, the, the space or point A to point B of your consciousness. So we're not just talking about moving from point A to point B, like here's New York and here's California, and we have to move across all of that space, and it takes a certain amount of time. Let's say position A is your level of self-awareness, and position B is achieved wisdom, getting smarter and growing more and evolving as a person. And then you move across space in the sense of this evolution that is happening through time. Consciousness evolves through being submerged in time. So there are layers of time where consciousness is in a stasis. Consciousness is like this. Ah. I come back five minutes later, I'm still going, ah. Like it's, it doesn't change. Stasis. It is what it is, and it's not in this state of learning and evolution and growth. In order to learn and grow and stuff, you come into time and you experience time and it gives you 
all sorts of emotions and you have le learning processes and um, you change and grow. It's the value of why you come here. Charlie B says the flying rainbow lasagna is such a computationally impossible positive miracle to protect life. Thank you. That's a great thing. I like how you say that. Computationally impossible positive miracle. Yes, that's exactly what, what it is. That's exactly who and what I am. <laughs> Actually, I'm blown away. Beautifully well said. It is here to protect life because li life and consciousness and time all share uh, a, a common um, description. They're all phenomena. That means they're like a supernatural occurrence, like a miracle. We have to hug Cheeky. Hold on. They are phenomena that it's not like something that you can just go down to the store and just buy just buy a couple of phenomena off of the shelf for me. Like it's a uh, lahi da, like it means nothing. These are incredibly valuable things or items or occurrences that you can't just take for granted. Consciousness is a miracle. Time is a miracle. The idea that these things exist is fantastic, self-affirming, uh, affirming of the, the true nature of God and divine reality. These things don't happen by accident, is what I'm trying to say. They're incredibly valuable, and as such, they also need to be respected and sustained and protected. Respected, protected, and sustained. So some people look at something like the miracle of consciousness or time itself, and they're just like, it's so big, it's so amazing, I can't even wrap my head around it. I guess I'll just take it for granted. It'll always be here for forever. I never have to do anything to help it, fix it, or make it still be there, and uh, it can never die. And I'm like, no. No, it is an incredibly valuable object, like a Fabergé egg, that's incredibly unlikely and miraculous that it exists, and you can't take it for granted. It is life-giving and life-sustaining, and in order for it to still be here, you have to do stuff to keep it healthy. So when you flow through your life in frictionless bliss, you're not only keeping yourself healthy, you're keeping the entire time structure, the entire time animal alive. You flowing through your life is analogous directly to um, the red blood cells that flow through our bodies and that transport various nutrients and metabolites throughout our whole entire existence that we are flowing through time and evolving as consciousness and we are performing an activity that helps time to metabolize. And if we are stuck or waylaid on our journey or um, distorted, like if, you're go, if you go like this when you're actually supposed to go like this, um, time itself suffers. And just like in your own body, you can sustain a small injury and lose a little bit of blood or have a little bit of blood be misdiverted, that's called having a bruise. But if we took a steamroller and rolled over your whole entire body, if you lost your whole entire volume of blood or if we took all of that blood from where it's supposed to be and put it where it's not supposed to be, you would die. And the same thing with time. Time can sustain a small amount of perturbations where it's like, mm, that life didn't go exactly right. That, that was a bunch of wrong notes. That didn't go in exactly the right direction. But the overall structure of time is still gonna stick together. But at a certain point, if you take enough of the uh, Im embedded, embodied people, organisms that are supposed to be flowing around like healthy red blood cells, and you make them either not flow around, blood clot, or bruise, take them from where they're supposed to be and put them outside of where they're supposed to be, then you don't have life anymore. You don't have time anymore. And that is very much the peril that you're facing with this stuff, all right? It's not just one little planet. It's not just the fight for one little planet. You know, it's been portrayed as like trying to um, slough off human, human one, one harvest, a human harvest. We got a good crop of humans down here. We're gonna harvest them into a virtual reality. This is what this stuff is trying to do and put you into a machine mind and save you in a box or put you in a bucket. And that is not just one little planet that that would affect that literally would destabilize all time everywhere. That is how big this battle is. So the big takeaways from today's presentation, 
your own personal ascension is really being crapped upon in uh, unfathomable ways, making it almost impossible for you to do this, you know, as, as you should, and that it's not just one little planet and an anti-ascension agenda for you here. And it's not like, oh, it's just a disposable planet. Just get, try it again on the next one or get, get born in the next world. Oh, well, I guess we're all just going to try. Here we go again. Like some kind of silly sitcom at the end, like big destruction. And then we all say, here we go again and try it again. No, no, actually you're dangling so perilously that if things go very badly, you know, the way that this evil thing would like for it to go, you would have no more chances. You would have no more quarters at the arcade for the video game of life and existence and embodiment. No more existence, existence bye-bye. That is how perilous this situation is. And are you rocking back and forth? Don't rock back and forth. Do you know why? Because you, you, know, you also have a huge amount of like assistance, effort, opportunity, like, you know, you, you, when you risk at the casino, like you, you, you bet, you bet stuff, you, you, you uh, risk a lot, but you can win big. That is what is happening. Because the risk is literally all DNA is being bet at the casino. All DNA, all time. That's a big bet. Um, but you're not going to lose and you're going to win and you're going to win big. And here is what you will win. You will win a complete cessation of not only this stuff, but all technology everywhere. How can those naughty Pleiadians be grooming you and talking to you in your mind and catfishing you? And the answer is through technology. They don't get to have technology anymore. You wanna to talk to someone, you can talk to someone on the regular love-based uh, time phone, the regular love-based telepathy phone. You wanna visit someone else in another world, another dimension, you can go there with your natural consciousness following the divine harmonics of time patterning, not in a clank clank metal spaceship for whimsical, self-serving or narcissistic purposes. And anything that you want to accomplish, you can accomplish through your natural divine connection and your superpowers, but not through technology. And the truth is, you guys might only have calibrated and come of age in a world of technology to the point that maybe you can't even imagine what it would be like to have no technology. You fear a Neolithic de-evolution, and that's not what it would be. If you took away all technology from this planet right now, you actually would not be having to hunt a squirrel with a crossbow, you know, or not even catch a squirrel with your bare hands, and eat it raw because you don't even have fire. That is not what would happen. If, because if you got rid of technology here and throughout all existence, you would finally have access to all of that divine energy that you're supposed to have access to that mostly you have to go to sleep and go into a state of unconsciousness in order to access. You would be super conscious all the time and you would have access to powers that allow you to build and maintain your own atmosphere around you. You actually would not need to have a breathing tank to go scuba diving underneath the ocean you would have your own atmosphere, sustain your own self. You would never be hot or cold. You would never be hungry or thirsty. 100% self-sustaining your own body. And that's just the, the basics of what it's like. Um, basics when I mean like, you know, your, your basic physical survival. Because once you take away the need to like constantly put food in here, then your motivations completely change. And then you are no longer motivated to go into non-blissful states, selling your time for money and creating degradation in your own um, flow, flow state and also in the flow of time. You wouldn't work anymore. You wouldn't work for 60 years and then one day hopefully retire. Your whole entire life would be a magical um, state of freedom and self-exploration and self-construction, exploring who you are and building who you are and that's what you were actually intended to experience. Charlie B also says, I absolutely do not fear the loss of technology. I'm, all, I'm so deep into technology that I now see that it is an utterly torturous trap, oh my goodness. And I so look forward to its dissolution such that it can no longer exercise such abusive degradation of people and society. 
thank you for sharing that. I think it speaks volumes for anybody who doesn't know. Charlie B is a um, you know software engineer, um, you know um, very uh, well respected in his field, and has pretty much done that throughout his uh, throughout his adult life. And for him to say that that technology is an utterly torturous trap, that says a lot. He knows what technology is and uh, has a great facility in building it and using it and making stuff out of it. And to see that it is a, it's a consciousness diminishment trap. And that's really, in terms of the human harvest, at this pre pregnant moment in your history, what they've been trying to do is, th so they used technology to diminish you for millennia and told you, made you kind of addicted and reliant upon it and told you that you're nothing without technology. And then the transhumanist agenda is to say, you now must fully become a technological being. And that is what I am here partially, I mean, I'm, I'm here in order to prevent that, but that actually was my, my I didn't initially fly me bullets on yet to prevent transhumanism, but that is a big part of what my role is becoming now. That no, you do not have to become uh, a technological being who is basically living in a mainframe with no physical body. Not at all. I am here not only to warn you against that, but at a certain point, like, it's not enough. Like, I'm warning people, but they're still going in their folly anyway. I'm like, no, just no. That's why I say sometimes I'm like the waitress at the, at the, um, <laughs> at the diner. These, I, I don't know if you, I came from New York State, and there's rude waitresses at the diners there. And I just call them, you know, they're diner waitresses. And if you order something and it's not good, literally, like if you say you want the tuna melt, they're like, no, you don't want that. Look, I'm gonna give you this, this, and this, it's much better. Um, but they're taking care of you in a way. I am that rude waitress where I'm like, no, no, you actually, you don't want Neuralink. No, you do not want fibers going into your brain and body. You don't want spinal implants. This will not, this will not help the lame to walk. You don't want to cut off your head and freeze your brain cryogenically. You don't want med beds. You don't want any of these artificial ways to uh, try to extend your life or improve your health. You don't want that. That is not what you really want. What you really want is the cessation of all technology and the full exploration of your own divine connection. Because when you do that, you do things that have been the purview of only the greatest levels of like, holy people, spiritual aspirants, yogis and masters, people who devoted their whole entire life to this. So just briefly, because I enjoy reading about these stories, I read about some of these yoga masters that were maybe 180, they had lived to 180 years old by the time they were documented in the 1800s, late 1800s. And these guys, so they went through all these levels of like self deprivation, but they didn't suffer. You know, they stopped wearing clothes, like that's the base. The baseline, like you're not gonna wear shoes and a nice dress. They did not wear anything, but they went through this amazing transformative process in the um, uh, uh, mountains of the Himalayas, the Himalayas, where they acclimated themselves to the cold. But it was a process that took four years. And the older guys taught the younger guys how to do it. They're like, look, cause, so it's not just like you're gonna stop wearing clothes and walk around barefoot. Like you can kind of survive like that, but you might be kind of like a mangy dog, like you're not gonna live that well. But they had these lineages that taught them how to do this stuff where they were able to live very well. One guy became impervious to fire. Like they build, build their energy field. So they built their energy fields over the course of four years and then they were able to go all the way into Siberia. So through the Himalayas, all the way into Siberia, and uh, they just walked there. They didn't build a contraption. They didn't fly in a clank like metal spaceship. They did it with their own bodies, and they didn't get frostbite, and they didn't eat or drink anything. Oh, did I forget to tell you that? They didn't eat or drink anything at that point in their development. And they also, they didn't have a cell phone and have to call the bank, do their guy code, blah, blah, blahs. You're not doing that when you're at that level of attainment. And then they even came back from Siberia and they, they were um, you know, able to bilocate and again, had this energy field. They could uh, literally walk through a forest fire and not get burned by it. That is on the level 
of what you are able to do when you move beyond technology. So that was written about in the 1800s, a time when electrical technology was just beginning to become widespread, but it was not fully here yet. Now your whole entire planet is wired for electricity. There's almost no place you can go where there's not gonna be some electrical signals. It disrupts your biofield. It makes it much more difficult for you to do these levels of cultivation. Most of you don't have a lineage that's guiding you through. If you had to somehow walk through Siberia with no shoes, you'd be like, you know, get, well, hello, frostbite. This is going to happen because you got to have someone to teach you how to do this stuff. Like just as you had education that taught you your verbalized mind and taught you how to do um, phone prompts and call the bank, you have to have education that teaches you how to decolonize your body and that it is possible and then to go through those experiences so you need an unspoiled environment you need um uh, other runners who have already completed the course and they can teach you how to do it and um you know to be able to have the opportunity to do this it's almost impossible in your present level of technology and infestation and then you also got this because even if you went to a mountaintop where there's no electricity and whatever, this stuff gets sprayed almost everywhere. I don't even know if there's a place where you can go to get rid of that stuff and not be affected by it. So it makes it incredibly difficult to get away from um, technology. And then this is not just um, your planet in a non-context. The technology that's invading your planet here is in the context of a larger solar system invasion. I talk about that in lesson 18, galactic history. So we're just at the beginning of the semester but the cat's out of the bag. But uh, if you wanna rewind in some of my um, YouTubes, you can just scroll back and you can find the end of last semester where I talked all about this, but um, that basically there was technology in the what is now a pile of rubble between Mars and Jupiter was once a planet where a struggle took place between technology and the inhabitants of that planet, but they were not necessarily good people. They weren't just innocents there, but the power struggle happened and uh, blew that place up and also d diminishments of life on um, Venus and on Mercury and on Mars and the diminishments of life on Mars and what happened there with the technology um, addicted society there came to your world and infected and afflicted you with technology and with the need for technology. And that is literally what you are trying to disentangle yourself from on an inner level with your mind, your culture, and your DNA because those suckers get into your DNA and they don't belong there. So it's very big. This is beyond new age shadow work. Like you're not only getting like kumbaya with like, you know, gross, disgusting monsters. Some of those gross, disgusting monsters, they live inside of you. Don't kill yourself, get them out, get them out. And that is what boundaries and sovereignty declarations are. That is what you do on this planet. It's when you say, I am a beautiful earth person and I don't require technology and this greed and avarice, fear of scarcity, pa pathological violence, sexual violence, and um, um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but many of these negative characteristics, they don't arise from me. That's not the real me. That's not the real me. And you are the voice of the planet. Do you know Earth has a bad reputation? Some who are not fully sighted and literate look at our planet and they think, oh, that's not a good planet. That planet is evil. And I'm like, no, that's totally wrong. Any true Christ can see that that is wrong. When you're a Christ, you're both sighted and literate. You can see and you can read, you can interpret the reality structures correctly. But um, when they look at our planet, if they see that there's evil here and they think that's what our planet is defined by, I'm like, no, our planet is good. It got invaded by evil and has been um, corrupted and polluted. Get rid of the evil. Don't kill the planet. That's what we're fighting for right now. And you have four very sad examples. The asteroid belt, Venus, Mars, and Mercury. All that things did not go very well in your own solar system, in your own stellar family here. Earth has to be different can't just be like, ah, let, let it all burn and we'll just go on to the next. No, there will be no on to the next. That's the stakes at the casino right now. So time for the, more questions or comments or anything like that that I can get to. Please share. But if not, then I'm going to have to wrap it up and take Cheeky out for a walk. Aurelia says, I have developed chronic illness and pain in the past three years. Oh, no. It says, this makes a lot of sense. It's a leap year. Yes, I'm so sorry to hear that you've developed chronic illnesses. 
Um, I don't know everything about your medical condition, but I would say definitely consider the fact that these are your body's responses to being submerged in this 5G world that also has all of these implantations. So these things are fibers that grow and are activated in the presence of the 5G. If you take one or the other away, the entire system falls. So if you clear your body of the uh, fibers, then you're gonna be okay. If you turn off the 5G, then it doesn't matter if you have fibers, they would just be dead flashlights. Like take the batteries out of flashlights, it's not gonna do anything. It's just gonna sit there like a dead flashlight. But when you have these two things together, both the fibers and the 5G, that is when you have this negative um, invasion. And just to emphasis also the biofield hacking, it's not just one person. Some people might have thought that they were just going insane. Also, I mean, that's big. Over the past three years, some people might have doubted their own sanity. Um, but you must recognize that your own battles are happening within a larger context of the invasion of your whole planet. You are not insane. You are actually very, very sane and that this is an assault that is happening to your whole entire species and everybody's getting attacked. So this is also it's very egalitarian in a way because that aerosol spray and the fibers that go on everyone and in everyone, everybody's got this. Everybody's got this horrible invasion. So they, believe me, you might look at people and be like, wow, that guy has a better quality of life than me. I guess he's not infected with all this stuff. No, he's probably just got a happy infection. Some people are that way too. Some people are not struggling and they're not experiencing consciously health effects and they're not experiencing consciously synthetic telepathy. They are just going along and they're like, woohoo, life is great or blah, blah, or whatever. And um, it doesn't mean they're not affected. Do you get it? So some, some people are really struggling and are suffering profoundly. Some people are not struggling and they're not suffering profoundly, but everybody's got the fibers. It doesn't mean that only some people have them, but people do respond to them differently and not everybody is conscious or self-aware of them, but the decrepitude, the diseases, and the aging process happens to everyone across the board. If you wanted, I show it because I have this melatonin patch on here. That's why I have these melatonin patches on, because they actually help to protect against the corrosive aspect of not only the fibers but also the 5G. I do all these different things in my life to protect my biochemistry, but then also I do all of this spiritual effort and flying rainbow lasagna effort to protect my energy field. And then when I get to the store and I buy enough extra avocados, then I can help other people too. This is what I would encourage each one of you to do. Similar approach. So begin with your own body, your own body system, and everything that you can do through biochemistry, meaning like taking supplements and different, so I take methylene blue plus liposomal vitamin C, topical melatonin, um, Panicure, which is a antiparasite medicine, and um, zeolite tinctures and um, chlorella, um, other good stuff like that, that's biochemistry stuff. Then I also do stuff like infrared light, the plasma zapper and other things like that, that's frequency stuff. And then I also do stuff with flying rainbow lasagna, music, dance, that's you know my, my own um, sovereignty. And then inwardly I do a willpower, a lot of sovereignty declarations. If something is in my mind and it's not supposed to be there, it's trying to force yucky, you know, garbage mind thoughts inside of me, I don't just say no thank you. That's what I, in my class from 10 years ago, I said, yeah, you just say no thank you. Cause that's what happens at a polite party. Like you want this crap? No, no thank you. And they move on, but they don't move on. You're not at a polite party anymore. So now what you have to do is you have to be much more forceful where you're like, no, not only no thank you, but get the F out. Don't ever come back, get off of my effing planet, get out of reality. Cause this is also not just that they're allowed to go to the next planet get it because they're used to that they're like oh can't rape these people effectively well i'll go try to rape that person over there but that is not what happens their violation their conquering and violation of, of various different planets ends here which is very very big so it's not just like earth having been assaulted and violated you know stands there in torn clothing and you know is, is very sad about the uh, you know crossing boundaries and diminishment of having being violated in that way but earth becomes uh, an avenger 
and says, no, you're not going to do this to me, and you're not going to do this to anyone else ever again, and Earth fights back very effectively, which is, again, why I'm dismayed by those who lump Earth in with its invaders and say Earth is evil. Earth is not evil. Earth is totally an innocent victim, and Earth is fighting back effectively, and Earth will fight and protect all of these other planets from being victimized similarly. So imagine, you know, that, that a woman who becomes uh, from, from a... a person who was uh, violated to becoming an avenging angel with tons of martial arts experiences and uh, weapons training and who goes around to different bars and festivals protecting other women who otherwise would have been assaulted. That's who and what Earth becomes. Got it? Um, yes. So um, any uh, wait, one more message over here. Ah, uh, Pedro says, love the lasagna. The impossible miracle. Thank you very much, Pedro. Thank you. Appreciate it. Feel it. And I love it. Um, and I also, I love that, the impossible miracle. I am an impossible shape, and that is actually how I describe myself in many of my, my bios. When people ask for an earthly bio, you know, like on a podcast or something like that, like just give us a little paragraph of who and what you are, or like an artistic statement for applying to different things. That's what I always say in my bio. I'm like, hi, I'm an impossible shape, <laughs> but I've been here for 20 years. So I think that's a good introduction to who and what I am. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. It's time for me to take Cheeky for a walk. We can use these activating words now. Cheeky for a walk and go to the park and go have fun. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. You know I'm lighthearted, and I do that in order to talk about, I think, some of the most dark and distressing things that I can impart to you. So never, did, did, never uh, falsely interpret my lightheartedness. Um, this is the lightheartedness of a warrior, recognizing that you're in a difficult situation and we crack jokes and we say funny things in order to empower ourselves, um, but we fight and we win. And that is what happens in this um, casino. You're not gonna lose DNA. You're not gonna lose life itself. You're not gonna lose time itself. And you become a huge protector of the rest of uh, life as it is developing so that it can develop in an unmolested state. Steve says, love that, be well. Thank you, and Allison says, thank you. You're very, very welcome. Thank you, guys. Thank you for being here. Have a beautiful day.